Celtic mythology. Wow. Uh, what a topic. Uh, I thought this one was, uh, was going to break me a few times. From the Greeks to the Egyptians to the Vikings, we've jumped into this pond before. And today we're jumping back in and maybe to the deepest part where the water is the murkiest. Mythology plays a fundamental role in any given society and generally rotates around narratives involving gods and goddesses, great heroes, the forces of evil, and sometimes also fairies. Celtic mythology is vast and strange and stretches back for many, many centuries. The Celts have some of the most bizarre myths that we've sucked so far, easily some of the hardest to pronounce names. Uh, Gaelic seems like it's closer to Klingon than to English. I thought Icelandic was my least favorite language to try and figure out. Now it has a very strong competitor. I'm going to try my best with it today. And I'll try my best to explain this complicated mythology. It's extra tricky because Celtic mythology was documented and preserved only through word of mouth by the Celts themselves. All the written accounts come from their enemies, conquerors, and Christian missionaries. And they all had agendas other than just recording descriptions of the Celts and their beliefs at face value. We don't know how honest early chroniclers were when it came to describing old Celtic gods, creatures, and origin stories, but we're pretty confident they were definitely not totally honest. However, at least they did record some of what the ancient Celts were up to. And, you know, uh, later they didn't toss out all the Celtic records into the fire, so we at least know a little bit about this ancient, vast, and mysterious culture. So let's get mystical today, Meat Sacks, on an ancient deep dive on creatures, gods, goddesses, druids, naked warriors, and so much more edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Uh, thanks for including me in your weekly plans. Thanks for just swinging by if you're just super interested about uh, Celtic mythology. And this is your first suck. Uh, I'm Dan Cummins, a suck master, a druid's apprentice, selkie seeker, Gaelic mangler, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, uh, praise be Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. A couple announcements again uh, this week, of course, and then show. Uh, Symphony of Insanity stand-up dates for the spring of 22 start this week week i do not have any celtic mythology jokes i'll be weaving into the stand-up but i do have some uh stories uh people have been finding amusing uh january 20 to 22nd at the la jolla comedy store january 23rd at the west hollywood comedy store and then orlando oklahoma city atlanta charlotte tempe missoula raleigh salt lake city davenport chicago all coming up uh, dates and tickets uh the, all the links up at dancummins.tv and then later on i'll announce uh fall dates uh, plank, plank, plank. Uh, the A-Hole Air Banjo Academy is backed by popular demand. Brand new colors for your newcomers to the Academy. Available in army green and black for your Appalachian air plucking. Uh, available now at badmagicmerch.com. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad that's back in the store. Uh, always brings up warm memories. Uh, you know, so, so enjoy, enjoy that one. Uh, one more announcement. Uh, the script keeper. It's a big one. Uh, Zach Flannery, uh, has now left the suck. Uh, he was getting pretty burned out on the research, and man, I get it. Research is not his passion. Uh, it is mine. Uh, he wanted to work here, and he did a great job. He was not only researching, uh, you know, but trying to do it in a way that worked for me, not for him, on top of other responsibilities here. Not an easy job. Uh, we loved having him on the team, but you know, his heart has long been in making his own music, working on his own projects, and so I'm excited for him to, to get back out there, return to his own world, build up his own mythologies. Uh, we're still going to hear from hear from him. He's uh, he's launching his own Script Keeper podcast here soon. I'll, I'll announce when he gives me uh, more info on it, and he'll be doing more shows as a solo artist with his music and as part of Sovereign Citizen, and I'm excited to see what he's going to create, truly. Uh, we, we thank him for his time here. Left on uh, what seemed to be great terms. And and I wish him the best. So now, let's get right into the research that may have been the straw that broke the script keeper's back. Ooh, he was telling me this was a rough one. He wasn't kidding. Celtic mythology. Uh, today, no timeline. The dates are way too uncertain. Uh, so here's how uh, I'm going to lay it all out. First, we're going to get to know a little bit about the, the island of Ireland where most of this information comes from. Uh, then we're going to learn about the Celts themselves, and then so much mythology. So many Celtic gods and goddesses, mythical heroes, villains, weird-ass creatures that populate the Celtic imagination, or at least a handful of them. Uh, also going to connect the dots from the rich tapestry of Irish myths to the rich history of Irish writers, 
We'll mention leprechauns, which are more folklore than mythology, but fuck it. They're fun to talk about. Uh, you'll hear about a salmon of knowledge eaten by a guy named Finn McCool. Uh, so, you know, that, that'll be uh, interesting. Uh, you'll meet banshees and fairies and vampires and so much more. Uh, it's going to be weird, sometimes confusing, but also a lot of fun. So let's, uh, let's just get into it. Since the Celts get associated uh, almost exclusively with the Irish uh, by most people, and because so much of this suck will take place in Ireland, or at least some fantastical version of it, let's take a few minutes to familiarize or re-familiarize ourselves with the Emerald Isle. Uh, Ireland is a country mostly known outside of Ireland uh, for Lucky Charm cereal. It's most recognizable cultural export, and frankly, the only one of, uh, of any real value. First mass produced in 1864, Lucky Charms was the first cereal in the world to include marshmallows, which had recently become a staple of Irish diet. During the Great Potato Famine that lasted from 1845 to 1852, a lot of Irish farmers started growing marshmallows. Uh, Technically a berry, marshmallow bushes can grow in almost any kind of soil and uh, are not adversely affected by potato blight. Since they have almost zero nutritional value, around a million million Irish people, you know, did still starve uh, eating those marshmallows, but their sacrifices... Not in vain. While starving, they figured out that marshmallows are pretty goddamn tasty. And uh, after tinkering around with the recipe for a dozen years or so, in 1864, Liam Phineas Patrick Connor Limerick McGregor, direct ancestor of the UFC fighter and most important person in Irish history, decided to design marshmallows into shapes that best represented the most important aspects of Irish culture. Uh, You may not know this, but Irish people love charms. God, they love a charm. Uh, They won't shut the fuck up about them. Strong believers in magic, nothing will captivate a true Irishman or Irish woman like a fun charm. That's why all the marshmallows are called charms. Uh, There's heart charms, said to give magical life to objects. There are star charms, uh, signifying the power of flight. Did you know that every year, over 10,000 Irish people die trying to fly? Uh, There are clover charms, which represent the power of luck. Uh, The Irish have long valued luck over work ethic, uh, skill, or good morals. Uh, Then there's the blue moon charm said to bestow the power of invisibility. This is uh, very coveted because most Irish people are criminals and often need to hide. Uh, There's the rainbow charm that is supposed to give you the power to uh, fucking teleport or something. Also included because Irish people, again, either all criminals or future criminals, and they often desire to escape quickly from the scenes of their many crimes. Uh, There's the red balloon charm symbolizing the power to float. Why do Irish people want to float? Well, this is a nod to their history of fleeing Ireland for better places to live in ships. And they can't swim. Show me an Irish person who can swim. I'll reveal to you a Scottish person pretending to be an Irish person for a gag. Finally, there's a unicorn charm, which is their assembly because the Irish fucking love unicorns. Holy shit, do they love them. And they think they're real. Uh, A recent survey found that 99% of Irish people believe that unicorns were real and 67% of them claim to either own or have ridden a unicorn at one point. Because over half of all Irish people are pathological liars. <laughs> JK, come on! Just, just, just goofing around. Just doing some goofs. Uh, that was not the real history uh, of, you know, uh, Lucky Charms or accurate information about the Irish. I just wanted to be ridiculous. And I feel comfortable going off since 23 and Me says I'm 55.8% Irish and British. Uh, don't love that they love those two, uh, that they lump those two together. But that's what happens when two nations that have historically not really cared for each other overall for centuries have also spent a good deal of time fucking each other. Uh, Some truth admits all that slander. Uh, Lucky Charms really was the first cereal to include marshmallows. Uh, Not invented in Ireland. Uh, General Mills came up with that shit in uh, Minnesota, 1964. A man of Irish descent did develop them, though, right? Irish-American product developer. John Houlihan, he wanted to jazz up some uh, Cheerio, Cheerio Cheerios-type cereal, with something reminiscent of circus peanuts, which were uh, one of his favorite, you know, guilty pleasure snacks. And the charm descriptions were real. As far as, you know, what, what the things represent without the Irish slander. Uh, it's the most delicious cereal ever invented also. So there you go. Uh, now let's, <laughs> let's get to know a bit. I just want to lighten things up to kick things off. Uh, let's get to know a bit about Ireland for real. Ireland is a country in Western Europe, uh, occupying roughly five, six of the westernmost major island of the British Isles. Just over five million Irish men and women live there today. And around 40% of them reside in the greater Dublin area. The only true big city in Ireland. Uh, that city's old dockside neighborhoods, you know, gave way to new residential and commercial developments. And Dublin looks awesome. Uh, I want to visit someday. A uh, very modern metropolis, Ireland's heart, the center of its education, arts, and culture, administration, and industry. As of 2018, the city was listed by the Globalization and World Cities Research Network as a global city with the ranking of Alpha Minus, which makes it as one, uh, one of the top 30 cities in the world. 
So a lot of good tech, medical jobs, and more there. Next biggest city in the Republic of Ireland is Cork, with the metro area population of uh, much less, around 300,000. A handsome cathedral city and port. Uh, after that, we drop down to Limerick, with the metro population of only around 160,000. Uh, Limerick is mostly known for dirty, dirty poems. There was once a man from Nantucket, and he was apparently very well endowed. And I'm not going to finish that, you know, because... Uh, uh, I find it to be a uh, very profane and body verse, and this is a clean, family-friendly show that I'm proud of. Oh my, <laughs> not today, devil. Oh my heck. Uh, no one knows for certain the connection between uh, short, often dirty, humorous poems and this city, actually. Uh, there, but there is thought to be, of course, some connection. Uh, what a small city it is. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where uh, I live, where the show is being recorded right now, metro population of around 170,000. And most people I know would uh, not consider Coeur d'Alene a city, uh, a town. I love it here, but it doesn't feel like a city to me. Uh, Crazy to me that it's about the same size as Ireland's third largest city. I've heard from a variety of people that Ireland was pretty rural. Uh, Did not know it was that rural until uh, this episode. Uh, Most Ireland is farm or ranch land. About 62% of Ireland's total land area used for agriculture. Beef and milk production account for around two-thirds of Ireland's agricultural output. A lot of cows. A lot of of sheeps. Uh, In 2020, there were 7.3 million cattle. 5.5 5.5 million sheep, 1.6 million pigs, almost 16.5 million chickens on Irish farms. Well, poultry. I shouldn't have assumed that's going to be chickens. No disrespect to turkeys. Uh, more cows and more sheep than people. A uh, lot, lot, lot more poultry than people. And a pig for every three people. And again, that's not what I expected. Uh, for an urban versus rural uh, comparison, as far as composition, uh, England next door, about twice as big as Ireland. Uh, geographically, 50,301 square miles to 27,133 square miles, but has over 11 times the population with about 56 million people. Uh, Another interesting fact about Ireland's population is that unlike almost every other nation on earth, Ireland's uh, population, as far as people, uh, much smaller than it was nearly two centuries ago, pre the Great Famine in 1844, due to all that potato uh, blight, the nation was estimated to have 8.4 8.4 million people. Then population declined pretty steadily thanks to starvation and a mass exodus until the turn of the century. Then it continued to drop further at a less drastic rate until 1961 when just 2.8 million people lived there. That's a huge drop. 8.4 million to 2.8 million. So many of those people immigrated to America, estimated that as many as 4.5 million Irish arrived in America. That's a gigantic percentage, you know, their population between 1820 and 1930. About half of them were just like, fuck it, let's let's go to America. Uh, Today, more than 31.5 million Americans claim Irish ancestry, second only to German at 43 million. 23 out of our 46 presidents claim Irish ancestry or have claimed. You know, they don't claim it currently because, you know, most of them are dead. But you get it. Uh, Started around 1960, Ireland's dwindling population did begin to bounce back and it started steadily climbing back and it's had healthy growth in recent years. Uh, They no longer are nations so economically and dietarily reliant on taters. In 1850, over 820,000 acres of Irish farmland dedicated to taters. Now just over 22,000 acres used, right? They've chilled way the fuck out on tater tots. Uh, The world can now rely on Idaho for its uh, shepherd pie production needs. Uh, Potatoes do grow well in the Irish climate and soil. Just before the famine, nearly half of Ireland's population relied, quote, almost exclusively on potatoes for their diet, is one academic source and the other half ate potatoes frequently. God damn, that's crazy. I love potatoes. I, I live in the state, I've grown up in the state most associated with taters in America, if not the whole world now. And that is, that's too many fucking potatoes, right? Like most, most of your diet, they must've felt so sluggish and tired all the time with all that starch. Uh, modern Ireland has a lot more to offer than livestock and taters. They've become a huge global player in the world of information and communications technology. Ireland exports the second most jobs into that industry of any nation in the world. Aviation been booming as well. Numerous large aviation companies building planes for the rest of the world. Uh, Thanks largely to recent growth, the construction industry also has boomed. In 2021, Ireland had the fifth fastest growing economy in the world. So times have gotten a lot better in recent years. Uh, Let's go over some geographical information now. Uh, The island of just over 5 million people a day separated from Britain at distances distances ranging from only 12 miles to around 120 miles. Uh, Ireland, like Great Britain, lies on the European continental shelf surrounded by seas that are generally less than 650 feet deep. Uh, Greatest distance from north to south, 302 miles on the island from east to west, 
171 miles. So it's not, it's, I mean, it's big, but it's not a gigantic island. Uh, the territory of the Republic consists of a broad and rippling central plain with limestone just under the surface. This plain uh, ringed almost completely by coastal highlands, which vary considerably in geologic structure. Uh, beautiful, uh, the, these uh, highlands. Uh, the flatness of the central lowland, which lies for the most part between 200 and 400 feet above sea level, raises up to 600 and then 1,000 feet in elevation, sometimes uh, in dramatic and scenic cliff fashion, in many places covered by low hills. The lowland scenic with numerous lakes, low ridges, large boggy areas, perfect for strange mythological creatures to roam about in. The principal mountain ranges are the Blue Stack Mountains in the north, the Wicklow Mountains in the east. Uh, there's a few minor mountain ranges, such as the McGillicuddy's, McGillicuddy's Reeks in the southwest and the 12 Pins in the west. Uh, McGillicuddy's Reeks, that's a fucking great name, by the way, uh, rise to the highest point in the Republic to an elevation of 3,414 feet. Not as mountainous as I expected, at least not compared to, you know, uh, not as mountainous compared to, you know, places in the U.S. Like numerous peaks just here in Idaho and not America's uh, most mountainous state by far rise to over 12,000 feet. Uh, Ireland's climate is classified as Western Maritime. I would also classify, classify it as, fuck, is it cloudy and raining again? Seattle or San Francisco-ish weather. Rarely warm enough for my liking. I love a hot summer day. Also rarely cold enough uh, to kill you quickly. The currents and weather systems generated by the North Atlantic Ocean directly dictate how a lot of shit goes down on the island weather-wise as it sits no more than 70 miles from any island or inland, excuse me, location. Uh, temperature pretty uniform across the island. The average temperature lies mainly between 4 degrees Celsius slash 39 degrees Fahrenheit and 7 degrees Celsius slash 45 degrees Fahrenheit in January and February. Coldest months of the year. Uh, in July and August, the warmest months, temperatures usually range between 14 degrees Celsius, 57 degrees Fahrenheit, and 16 degrees Celsius, 61 degrees Fahrenheit, although occasionally considerably higher readings are recorded. Highest temperature ever recorded, 33.3 Celsius, 92 Fahrenheit, logged at uh, Kilkenny Castle way back in June of 1887. So it doesn't get close to 100 degrees there ever. Not that close. Uh, the coldest, uh, negative 19 degrees Celsius, negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit at uh, Marcree Castle back in January of 1881. Apparently the weather was wilder over there in the 19th century. Also rains a lot. I long wondered why the Emerald Isle, so damn green. And the main reason, not surprisingly, you know, is uh, shit. Uh, literally, fertilizer. Common custom in Ireland to shit outside. Only one in 20 homes have toilets and they're generally only used by the weak and or the elderly. It's frowned upon, looked at as a sign of poor character to pop a squat on the jacks, aka the toilet. Everyone else is uh, expected to do their part, you know, and uh, feed the yard, as they call it over there. Irish people like to feed the yard. Uh, wait, I might be confusing the uh, Ireland with Poland right now, or maybe I'm just making up uh, strange insanity for my own amusement. Yeah, no, that's the last one. Uh, no, the reason Ireland is so green is either magic or the weather. Probably weather. Almost never gets real, real hot. The kind of heat wave that would kill grass and shrubs, etc. And it rains quite a bit. Good for making grass, you know. The bells of Ireland, clovers, and uh, all that stuff real green. In the, south, in the south and the east of the country, it rains about 150 days a year. While the west coast gets about 225 days a year of rain. Uh, and that rain is rarely torrential, usually mild, but still that's a lot of fucking rain. That's a lot of rainy days. That much rain, plus very little heat. Plus, uh, not getting too cold, you know, doesn't average below freezing temperatures during even the coldest months of the year. Plus, good soil equals a green ass place. And it gets pretty foggy in a lot of places in Ireland as well, which keeps things looking green as, uh, you know, a bit magical. Uh, some places get around 100 days of fog a year. Not all day fog, but still, that's, that's quite a bit of fog. Uh, I have to wonder if this weather helped lead the country, uh, you know, to having uh, so many great authors per capita. Overall, much more of a, eh, let's stay inside. Have a hearty stew. Maybe read or write a book kind of place. As opposed to a, hey, let's grab a sun sunscreen. And then uh, run down to the beach kind of place. Not a lot of uh, good uh, suntan beaches in Ireland. I googled best beaches in Ireland. And Google just said, we didn't find any criteria matching your search. So then I googled best places to see a lot of Irish women in bikinis. And a lot of photos of Miami came up. Uh, joking, of course, but it is not a nation known for bikini weather. But it is beautiful. Uh, if you really want to do a, an internet search, type out most beautiful places in Ireland and be amazed. A lot of photos uh, are so fucking green, they seem photoshopped. They seem like they got filters on them. It's too lush looking. 
Never been to Ireland, uh, sadly, but Lindsay has. A lot of my friends have. And they said it is that green. It is that gorgeous. Some of these states and the castles on them are ridiculous. Uh, like the uh, Care Castle, the Rock of Cashel, uh, the Tipperary or Ross Castle in Kerry. Every time I see the word Tipperary, I don't know about you guys, but it reminds me of my favorite song of all time. I'm sure you've heard it. The British Army song, It's a Long Way to Tipperary. This is a real treat. Uh, you have to hear it. It's so good. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary to the sweetest girl I know. A little bit more. Goodbye, Piccadilly. <laughs> yep. Farewell, Leicester Square. Mm. It's a long way. To yeah, sure is. My heart's right there. God, they don't still make songs like that uh, anymore, do they? They just, don't, they just don't make them like they used to. Thank fucking God. Holy shit, I hate that kind of music. Uh, that old kind of uh, marching band style, old timey stuff. I would, I would rather truly have a, uh, I would rather have someone fucking jam pencils in both my ears. Just fucking make me deaf for the rest of my life. than have to hear that song on repeat for, I don't know, even a month. Anyway, there are a lot of castles. There are over 30,000 castles and castle ruins around Ireland. I, I looked that up in multiple sources because I was like, get the fuck out of here. That's too many. Eh, apparently it's true. When you count all the little ones and you count the ruins, uh, there's so many castles, plus morning fog, plus so much green, plus gorgeous, surreal looking seaside cliffs in many places, plus all the folklore and the mystical associations with Celtic culture. It gives Ireland a real enchanted vibe. Good place to build some strange creature lore. Can't wait to get to that part of the show. Uh, first, a bit more on the history of Ireland. Uh, look at who the Celts were since we'll be exploring their mythology. While well, Ireland is mostly associated with Celtic culture, a lot of other people settled there over the years. You know, Ireland uh, has long had its own culture. It's also uh, been ruled by foreign invaders for much of its written history. Uh, the Celts are thought to have showed up in Ireland sometime during the 4th century BCE. Before then, the first evidence of human presence goes back at least as far as 33,000 years. And uh, we don't know for, for sure who those original wild fuckers were. Maybe leprechauns, maybe selkies, maybe spriggans, probably fomorians. Uh, by as early as the first century CE, Ireland entered a historical Celtic phase known as Gaelic Ireland. Before the Norman invasion of 1169, all of Ireland was culturally and politically Gaelic, which means of or relating to the Gaels and especially the Celtic Highlanders of Scotland. Uh, culturally, Ireland and parts of Scotland are pretty closely related there's a shared root between the native language of Ireland, Irish, and the native language of the Scottish Highlands, Scots Gaelic, both of which are part of the Goidelic family of languages. They came from Celtic people who settled in both Ireland and Scotland. Doesn't mean that the Irish and Scottish are genetically super similar, though. There's a lot of similarities, of course, but the Irish also share a lot of similarities with the English, uh, the Welsh, other people because of all the different people mixing into the area over the years. As I went over in an episode on the IRA, Suck 74, way back, uh, figuring out who's genetically related to who in the UK is a pretty murky affair. The Celtic people, one of several ancient peoples, and there was a variety uh, even amongst the Celts, uh, you know, never truly had a cohesive kingdom in Ireland. They were a loose amalgam of tribes, communities, and uh, disparate groups that came together for shared purposes such as defense, worship, trading, and hunting. These tribes almost had their culture disrupted or destroyed by the Romans in the first century CE. In 82 CE, Rome's military governor in Britain turned his attention to Ireland briefly. He defeated England's Queen Boudicca, the Celtic queen in 61 CE, and then continued to subdue the entire nation, bring it under Roman rule. But then he had to deal with the mutiny within, within his own army in a Scottish rebellion. Once he'd subdued a picked uprising in Scotland, he was recalled to Rome, and the Romans never came back to Ireland, not militarily. But they did disrupt the culture uh, through the new religion of Rome. They did a little bit of a cultural takeover. And Christianity showed up in the mid-5th century. Uh, following the arrival of the British Roman missionary St. Patrick and some other missionaries, uh, you know, 4th century. Uh, then the uh, arrival of the, uh, you know, of other Christian missionaries in the early to mid-5th century CE. Christianity took over the indigenous religions of the Isle. The Celtic Druids were on their way out. Christianity began replacing and absorbing old pagan and Celtic traditions and beliefs heavily by the year 600 CE. Said that uh, by some Christ historians that Catholicism was able to take over as the dominant religion on the island following a mass killing of Druids, the religious leaders of the Gales. And I don't believe it. Get, get out of here. There's no way that happened. If there's one thing I know about the history of the Catholic Church in Europe, it's that it's very peaceful. Uh, I don't think they ever killed anyone. Uh, even with Christianity's newfound prominence, traces of Celtic culture remained. 
Ireland's national symbol, the shamrock, green three-pronged leaf, represents the Holy Trinity of Catholic tradition. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Celtic cross represents the region's unique take on the Catholic cross. After the Catholics, the Vikings showed up. Another very peaceful group. Uh, those guys, you know, known mostly for being polite, uh, being pacifists. At the end of the 8th century, uh, and during the 9th century, Vikings from you know, uh, what we now call, now call Scandinavia began to invade, rape, and plunder, and gradually settle into and mix with Irish society. Uh, the Vikings settled in what became Dublin, Ireland's capital city, starting in 841 CE. By the early 11th century, almost all the Vikings in Ireland had either been culturally absorbed or kicked out. After that, there was the Norman invasions that began in Ireland in 1169. Large swaths of Ireland came under the control of Norman lords, leading to centuries of conflict with the Gaelic Irish. The King of England claimed sovereignty over the island as a whole, but it would take centuries for England to bring all of Ireland under control. In 1542, Henry VIII of England declared himself King of Ireland, and the English doubled down on their efforts to conquer the island. By 1607, Ireland was uh, fully under English control, bringing the old Gaelic political and social order completely to an end. And then in 1798, Ireland freed itself briefly, very briefly. Just three years later in 1801, England brought them back in. Ireland formally incorporated into the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in 1801. And that nation lived under that name until 1922. Ireland wouldn't fully truly uh, or wouldn't finally truly be fully completely independent until the Republic Act of April 18th, 1949. Not that long ago. Okay. So now that we know some, uh, uh, you know, a little bit about Irish history, lay the land there. Let's go back further to meet the OG Celts. They didn't start out in Ireland. They made it there many, many centuries after their culture and language formed. Ireland likely the last place they settled, actually. And then because of its distance from Rome and other conquerors from mainland Europe, Celtic culture got to hide out and stick around the longest there. One of the earliest references to the ancient Celts comes from former Suck subject Alexander the Great, who met some Celts from the Alps. Uh, region of Europe, way back in 335 BCE. Oh, he was resting after a battle on the banks of the Danube River. He'd never seen such tall, fierce-looking warriors with golden neck rings, colorful cloaks. One of many historical contemporary accounts of the Celts being tall, muscular, and just fierce-looking. Alexander feasted with them, asked them what they feared the most at one point, and it was written that they laughed, said they feared nothing at all, and he believed them. And he didn't even sneak away from after hearing that. That's a scary dude who fears nothing, but I don't think Alexander feared much either. Uh, where did they come from? No one knows. Not exactly where the Celts came from. Uh, perfect for a story about their mythology, right? More mystery. The oldest possible, even probable Celtic settlement uncovered by archaeologists lies in the little 900-person lakeside village of Hallstatt, Austria, founded sometime between the 12th or sometime around, excuse me, the 12th century BCE, and they were probably Celtic. Not everyone's convinced that the Hallstatt culture was Celtic. And the house that was, you know, ground zero for Celtic culture. Uh, Celtic or not, but probably Celtic. Uh, house that was founded because of rich natural resources. They had salt mines, also mined copper and tin nearby. Uh, and they would trade, you know, to outlying regions. Salt, huge back then, used to preserve meat. So it would keep over the winter. Also one of the oldest known forms of currency on earth. Uh, salt crystals have been harvested in China as uh, early as 6,000 BCE. And the, the term salary actually derived from the Latin term salarium, which means salt money. Uh, I mentioned that before in an episode. Not sure which one. Maybe maybe the Alexander the Great suck. Too bad today's money isn't so tasty. It'd be super cool if you could like grind down a dollar, uh, you know, or a quarter into some fucking seasoning if you wanted to and enhance some casserole flavor with some nickel or penny shavings. Uh, copper and tin, also mined by early Celts and Hallstatt. Uh, yeah, both, uh, you know, to forge bronze for weapons, tools, etc. Uh, whether or not Hallstatt was truly Celtic by Alexander the Great's time, uh, Celtic people were definitely in Europe and had been for centuries, spread out from Asia Minor in the east, present-day western Turkey, to the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and the Atlantic Isles of Britain and Ireland in the west. Uh, they were at their height, geographically at least, the largest group of people to inhabit ancient Europe. Hard to trace a lot of their uh, migration with any degree of certainty, but they seem to have spread out from the Alps. They didn't have, they didn't leave any, they didn't leave any notes behind to give us hundred percent certainty, you know, exactly what, uh, what their spread entailed. Hello, future knowledge seeker. My name is Kale Kalean, red pelt. I am Celt person. My, my people lived here in this dirt mound place in 1034 BCE before I die. I mean, right now I'm not dead, but someday I'll be dead. And then maybe you read this. My parents were cave people. We were thus uh, first Celts to live here. 
Hope this helps. Uh, hope whoever reading has medicine and AC and showers. Seems nice. Life for us now sucks. Uh, archaeologists, linguistic historians, uh, other scholars have determined that the Celts spoke their own language but did not have their own complex writing system. Leave us any good notes or any books or history of their people or anything. Almost all of what we know about them, you know, written by enemies or conquerors. So we'll never be able to completely separate fact from propaganda. Uh, Celts, also not a unified group, which makes pinning down exactly, you know, what went on with them hard as well. There were hundreds of independent tribes who shared genetics and a language, but not a big unified empire. Uh, never developed to that point uh, that, or to the point that they built big cities or monuments either. Not like so many other cultures, like say the Greeks or Romans did. I think of Stonehenge when I think of a big Celtic monument even though it's not that big actually. And though it, it wasn't actually built by the Celts. Long thought to be, but now archaeologists think it was built before the Celts showed up in England by an unknown group of people. Maybe those Fomorians, right? Maybe leprechauns, we don't know. Well, when someone describes something as Celtic today, they're generally referring to something connected with the people and culture of the six modern Celtic nations. Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, Brittany, and the Isle of Man. Historic Celtic groups uh, of Celts or Celts uh, included the Gauls, uh, Celtiberians, uh, Galatians, uh, or excuse me, Galicians, Galatians, Britons, Gales, and their offshoots. Uh, today, their legacy is most prominent in Ireland, of course, and also Great Britain, especially in Wales, Scotland, Cornwall, where traces of their language and culture still exist. Are there other Celtic parts of the world? Depends on who you ask. Some think there could be a seventh, uh, even eighth Celtic nation. And these aren't, of course, you know, real nations like political separate entities today, but just what are referred to as Celtic nations. Uh, the potential seventh is Galicia in a northwest corner of Spain. Uh, Galicia has a strong Celtic identity, including stone circles and forts and use of bagpipes and local music. Oh, the bagpipe. <laughs> the devil's accordion. Uh, the bagpipe is the rare instrument that sounds just as good when played by someone with literally no musical training at all. As it does, uh, you know, when being played by the world's best bagpipe player. Uh, not really kidding, in my opinion. Uh, here's a clip of Jack Lee, one of the best bagpipe players in the world. Uh, this is from 2006. This is a world champion. <laughs> like, literally, they have world championships for bagpipe. He's a world champion in the bagpipe. And here's how he sounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's really, really, really good bagpipe. Now, here's a dude on a street corner in Italy uh, who I think is drunk. And from a video labeled just worst bagpipe, bagpipe player ever. I mean, I know the first guy knows a lot more about what he's doing, but I find neither song uh, pleasing to my ear. Sorry, bagpipe lovers. All six of you. Un unlike the previous six Celtic nations, no Celtic language has uh, been spoken in Galicia since the Middle Ages. Northern Port Portugal might be the eighth Celtic nation as it has cultural traits similar to Galicia in the sense that there is a Celtic identity, but no Celtic language has continued into modern times there either. Uh, the Celtic League is in charge of who makes the rules as to uh, who is a Celtic nation and who isn't. And they uh, only recognize the first six, nation, six nations. And who the fuck is a Celtic League? Unfortunately, uh, they are not something akin to the Justice League. Justice League. Not a group of superheroes. Who all happen to have Celtic uh, origins. Not like, you know, Selkie Lady and, uh, you know, f uh, Fairy Man. Uh, the real Celtic League founded at a uh, music festival of all places in 1961. A group of uh, several individuals. Very serious about uh, Celtic culture. From their website, the League was founded by Celtic nationalists who saw the need for an inter-Celtic organization with a political dimension in order to make the peoples of all Celtic nations more aware of their commonality in terms of their language, history, and culture to further the Celtic nation's right to independence and to promote the benefits of inter-Celtic cooperation. And it does not seem like that fight is going uh, very well for this group at least. It doesn't seem like many more people have joined since that initial music festival in 1961. Uh, the website... Doesn't look, doesn't look like it's been given a refresh in about 15 years. Uh, their official YouTube channel, been out for many years, has 319 subscribers. So if you're serious about helping Celtic nationalists further the rights of Celtic independence, you're going to want to find these guys. You're going to help them out. You're going you're to want to like and subscribe. They're going to have a hell of a time pulling off uh, any kind of revolution 
with a couple hundred people who, based on the subjects of their videos, are mostly retired and long retired. It's an older group. Uh, what do we know about the ancient Celts from the Celtic League nations and elsewhere? Uh, each tribe had a warrior king, a religious center, typically lived in and around a hill fort. Clustered around the hill forts were burial mounds starting somewhere between the 6th and 9th century BCE. The Celtic culture seems to have started to become higher, hierarchy. oh man, seemed to develop a hierarchy. <laughs> that word, no matter how, hierarchical. Ah, maybe that's right. And the elites would be buried into these big tomb mounds with a lot more jewelry, bronze, gold, ivory, and jewels than the comic folk had. Uh, we meet sacks of long loved shiny shit. And the Celts made some really nice shiny shit. Uh, elaborate Celtic designs and artifacts crafted from gold, silver, precious gemstones, a, a major part of museum collections throughout Europe and North America now. And replicas worn by all kinds of people around the world today. And I would say more of those people believe in stuff like wood nymphs, gnomes, and fairies than people who don't wear Celtic jewelry. Uh, many of these items have been excavated from ancient Celtic hill forts, burial mounds across Europe. Remnants of clothing have also been recovered. Ancient Celts are uh, famous for their colorful wool textiles, forerunners of the famous Scottish uh, tartan. And while only a few tantalizing scraps of these textiles survived uh, over the centuries, historians believe that the Celts also one of the first European people, if not the first, to wear pants. Uh, one famous example of a burial mound where lots of shiny and other cool Celtic stuff was found is uh, in the small village of uh, Hofdor, Germany. I'm watching Game of Thrones again, and I just wanted to say, Hodor, H Hodor, Hodor. Only Game of Thrones uh, fans will understand what I'm doing right now. Uh, but the small village of Hofdor, Germany, and it held the remains of a Celtic chieftain and a shit ton of artifacts pointing to a complex and stratified Celtic society. The Hodor, uh, ha God, I, I have Hodor, Hodor, Hodor chieftains. The Hofdor chieftain's mound dates from approximately 530 BCE, what archaeologists call the late Hallstatt period, when Celtic culture was concentrated in Central Europe. Chieftain laid out on a long bronze couch with wheels dressed in gold finery, including a traditional Celtic neckband called a torque. He was surrounded by ornate drinking horns, large bronze cauldron, which still held the remains of a high-proof honey mead. That's pretty cool. You know, the mead remnants lasted that long. Uh, I have tried honey mead a few times, even some honey mead based on ancient recipes, and uh, having a real hard time getting into it. It's very sweet. Uh, the drinking equipment points to the critical role of feasting at a, as a socio-political tool to the salt, Celts, Celts, Jesus Christ. I, sh I should have just changed. I, uh, I'll, I know it's Celts, but my brain has been trained my whole life to see a C and then an E and be like, sa, not ka. Uh, what the Greeks and Romans described as excessive drinking was actually a way for Celtic elites to strengthen ties with allies. And that continued into the great beyond. Hell yeah. Getting fucked up with people is a great way to strengthen social ties, right? That's never stopped in human society. Was then, is now. Uh, I never did any more bonding with a group of people in my life than I did with my old college buddies. And we bonded mostly by getting fucked up together all the time. I bet those Celt drinking parties were wild. A lot of singing, a lot of hugging, a lot of laughing, quite a bit of fighting, probably a lot of fucking. Uh, warriors would also be buried with bridles, tackles, slashing swords used for fighting on horseback. Based on this, they clearly had some sort of cavalry and they had horse-drawn wagons. Got to carry that salt around for trade. By 600 BCE, they were trading with a lot of the Greeks and other early people around the North Mediterranean. The earliest known mention of the Celts is from a Greek writer from 517 BCE, referred to as the Keltoi, another, uh, ancient Greek for the tall ones. It's from that word that we get the word Celt. And these tall ones maybe could have kicked a lot of Greek ass. Maybe could have uh, then taken down the Roman Empire if they would have ever unified. But not only did they not do that, they also fought each other as enthusiastically and fiercely as they fought non-Celts, legendarily fierce fighters. Uh, they believed in reincarnation, that they would be reborn to live and feast and fight again on earth if they died in battle. And it's thought that, uh, you know, this for sure contributed to their reputation for fearlessness. And that is scary, right? I don't want to fight anyone to the death, not at this moment anyway. But if I do have to fight someone to the death, I would prefer not to fight someone who is so confident that they'll just be reborn, right? If they die in battle, that they just don't fucking care about dying. Uh, some of them also, some of them also fought naked. That freaked out a lot of their opponents. I bet. Uh, reminds me of the berserkers we learned about back in Suck One Thirty Five and the Vikings. Right, extra level of intimidation. If some guy who wants to kill you, some tall, muscled, fierce-looking guy with some big long sword, battle axe, is running at you with his dick and balls flopping around. Extra intimidating if he has a boner. Everyone fears the war boner. Bojangles just whimpered, right? Bo Bojangles fears almost nothing. A war, born, war boner makes him nervous though. Uh, the kinds of weapons and the battle techniques used by the Celts varied quite a bit from tribe to tribe. One group of Celts, 
thought to have invented chainmail, uh, the signature armor of medieval Europe, right? Uh, that classic medieval armor, rusty masses of metal were found in some Celtic graves dating back to as far as 400 BCE, and they were identified as being the remains of old chainmail. Also regarding Celtic fighting, ancient Celtic warriors loved to cut a motherfucker's head off. God, they loved a head. Uh, the greatest trophy an ancient Celtic warrior could possess was the severed head of their enemy. They would sometimes preserve these heads in jars of cedar oil, take them out, show them to fellow warriors, other guests, etc. Right? Make yourself at home. <laughs> Let me go grab you some mead and uh, pull some new human heads out of jars for you to gaze upon. You know, later, this guy's wife checking in with him. How was Brennan's dear? Did you have fun looking at all those heads and keeps in jars? God, uh, I love how like what is so normal uh, in one culture, not, not only normal, but a point of pride can be completely barbaric, be considered evil even in another culture, in another place in time, right? Back in some ancient Celtic village, dude welcomes you into his house, shows you a bunch of jars he has heads in. He can be the nicest, coolest dude in town. Everyone loves Gaius. Hey, he's a great dad. He's a solid warrior, a doting husband, so many jars full of cool heads. Guy today shows you his uh, jar of heads collection. You need to fucking attack him or flee immediately. Whichever option gives you the best chance at survival because he's a fucking serial killer. Because these Celts were so feared in battle because they didn't gather themselves into one big Celtic army, uh, they were often hired as mercenaries by foreign rulers. Uh, great reputations as being intimidating mercenaries. Uh, in addition to warriors, they weren't just all warriors. They also had skilled craftsmen making their jewelry, art valued in their society and the people who could make it highly. Uh, weapons, utensils, other tools being made, you know. They had bards, storytellers, great myth makers. They were very valued. Poets who developed uh, their mythology before they ever put anything to paper or stone long before. And boy, did they ever develop some stories. Uh, and, and do their stories reek of an oral tradition? When you don't ever write shit down for centuries and you never use an editor, your stories can get a little... Uh, a hard to follow. Uh, the upcoming mythology has so much, what the fuck is happening right now in it? Uh, the Celtic bards would sing of the great deeds of dead heroes and warrior kings, share tales of fantastical beasts. Makes me think of the, uh, <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, why am I just bringing this up randomly? The the, the witcher. <laughs> Toss a coin to the witcher, oh valley of plenty. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's these bards make me think of. But anyway, they share all these great, great, great deeds. Uh, also would craft, you know, new songs about current warrior kings, etc. Uh, sometimes not always, uh, you know, nice songs about the, the current warrior kings. Uh, the bards would mock those alive or dead who they considered cowardly or incompetent. That'd suck. You know, if you're the chief warrior, your own bard is just singing songs like, Oh, here is the tale of the warrior king Aiden. In his jaws are heads full of pagans, or are they? Or does he have extra honey to help him wash down his mead? Does he keep his balls in them and take them out only when his wife wants to breed? The warrior king fights from the back of his flock. He's never naked, for the enemy would laugh at the size of his cock. And then you'll find the king's like, oh, that's enough! Okay! <laughs> All right, Bart Sweeney, that's quite enough singing for tonight. Uh, how about we go back to the drawing board with that one? I'd like you to work on the melody a little bit. I'd like you to work on the lyrics uh, a lot. Not a fan. Uh, the Celts also had those druids. They're priests to become a druid. One didn't have to be highborn or anything. You just had to be uh, really good at memorizing shit. You had to be willing to train for several years, memorizing who the gods of old were, what they did, the old heroes, what rituals were required to worship them, and so much more. Uh, you know, uh, it seems like the number one criteria for being a Druid really was having a good memory, right? In ancient Celtic society, the Druids, uh, healers, teachers, politicians, in a sense, uh, judges, uh, their equivalent of, uh, excuse me, of scientists had to remember everything, not writing any of this shit down. Uh, they were immensely respected. According to old legends, they could walk out into battle into the middle of fighting and not be touched. They could stop fighting between two warring tribes of Celts. No one fucked with the Druids, except of course for the Romans and anyone not a Celt. Uh, those other people fucked them a whole bunch and, you know, killed a shit ton of them, but not the Celts. Celtic warriors would be uh, too worried about incurring the wrath of the gods to risk hurting or disobeying them. Maybe. Maybe in all this, of course, right? Again, a lot of what we know about the Celts outside of what has been found at archaeological digs comes from what other cultures uh, thought, the cultures who fought them. Mainly the Romans. The Roman Empire, who would destroy and or absorb most of the Celtic tribes in mainland Europe, referred to the Celts as Gali, meaning barbarians. They called a lot of people barbarians. Uh, you know, they didn't know you. 
and they didn't like the way he talked. He looked a little rough. Well, you're a fucking barbarian. Most of the Celts eventually lost to Rome, but they did give them a lot of trouble before they went down. The following account seems to be believed by most historians. The story of a fearless Celtic warlord named Brennus and his invasion uh, is told by a number of Roman historians. Uh, but they were writing about it centuries after the fact, drawing on earlier original sources no longer in existence. And some think Brennus is a mythological character, a propaganda figure used to rally future Romans against the barbaric horde. We have to kill them before they sack us again like Brennus, you know, like that kind of shit. But he could have been real, real tough motherfucker. Uh, if true, in three, 387 BCE, Brennus annihilated a Roman army, then violently sacked, pillaged Rome, even put most of the Roman Senate to the sword. Uh, you know, after he and his army kicked the shit out of uh, several other cities on their path to Rome, he would then hold Rome collectively hostage, you know, captive for several months before collecting a heavy ransom and then bouncing. Brennus is famous for his repeated saying, woe to the vanquished. Nice. Brennus' sack of Rome was the only time in 800 years, if it happened, that the city was occupied by a non-Roman army before the fall of the city to the Visigoths in 410 CE. Brennus was the uh, warrior king of the Sinones, Gaulish for the ancient ones. And prior to Brennus, this uh, tribe of Celts had settled on the coast of the Adriatic Sea in present-day Italy, due east of Florence, having traveled down from the Alps due to either their love of wine and warmer weather or because Gaul, they felt, was just too overcrowded due to various historical accounts. I hope the, I hope the wine story is true. I hope they taste the wine for the first time and they're like, what? that shit is delicious. Oh man, check out that beach too. Oh, hot damn. I love a good grape. I love a good bikini. More of this. Let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's fucking pillage this shit. Uh, the Romans would clash with the Celts often, beginning with the reign of Julius Caesar in the first century BCE. The Romans launched a massive military campaign against the Celts, killing them by the tens of thousands, destroying their culture in much of mainland Europe. Fucking Rome. There could have been so many more leprechauns and selkies and uh, shit if Romans, uh, you know, hadn't driven them all out of mainland Europe. Julius Caesar embarked on the nine-year Gallic Wars to defeat the Celts and various other tribal kingdoms in Gaul, modern-day France. Caesar wrote about the conquest of Gaul with a mix of disgust and respect for his Celtic enemies in his account called Commentaries on the Gallic War, a first-hand account slash propaganda piece on nine years of fighting there. A lot of what we know about the ancient Celts, you know, in mainland Europe comes from Caesar. He wrote a lot about the practices of their Druids, for example. More on that in a bit. Uh, Caesar's Roman armies would attempt an invasion of Britain, but were unsuccessful, and thus the Celtic people, either those who had already settled there or been pushed there by Roman advances, uh, were able to establish a homeland. Had Rome pushed farther west, Ireland would likely not be so associated with Celtic heritage like it is today, or associated with it at all. Other Celts who didn't make it to the British Isles did establish small pockets of Celtic life in mainland Europe, like tribes of the Galatians. The Galatians occupied much of the area of what is now northern Spain. Uh, they successfully fought off attempted invasions by both the Romans and the Moors the latter ruling much of present-day southern Spain. Evidence of Galatian tradition remains in the region today. Descendants of the Galatians still participate in ancient outdoor dances accompanied by bagpipes. Oh, more, more of this! Yay! Oh, sweet! Uh, that's an instrument, you know, often associated with uh, more well-known Celtic regions, such as Scotland and Ireland. In addition, a Celtic symbol called the Cruz de la Victoria, the victory cross similar to a Celtic cross adorns a regional flag there. The Galatians, as we've discussed, also settled in uh, nearby Galicia, a region on the northwest co coast of Spain. And yes, those familiar with the Bible, the Celtic Galatians are the people the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to in the first century CE, and uh, many were converted to Christianity in the first two centuries CE. Uh, tribes of Britons and Gauls settled in the northwestern corner of present-day France, the region known today as Brittany. Celtic tradition survived in this region as it was uh, geographically isolated from the rest of France. Many festivals and events still held today can trace origins to ancient Celtic times. Many of the French Britons also wear traditional Celtic hats called coiffes. Roughly one quarter of the region's residents can speak Breton, a Celtic language similar to Welsh. Although Caesar's invasion of Britain was unsuccessful, the Romans did eventually mount a successful attack against the Britons following Caesar's murder in the first century CE. This incursion effectively pushed the Britons on the island west to Wales and Cornwall, north to Scotland. In fact, the Romans built Hadrian's Wall, remnants of which still stand today near what is now the border between England and Scotland in 120 CE. The wall designed to protect the conquering Roman settlers from the Celts, who, you know, fled north. Uh, neither the Romans nor the Anglo-Saxons, who took what is now England from the Romans in the 5th century CE, were able to successfully invade Ireland. This enabled the Celtic tribes that had settled there to survive the longest. It allowed their culture to flourish the longest. And that allowed a bunch of crazy fucking stories to come around, as we'll soon see. 
After the Roman conquest of most of the other Celtic lands, Celtic culture was further trampled by Germanic tribes, Slavs, and Huns during the migration period of roughly 300 to 600 CE. As a result, few, uh, if any, people living in mainland Europe and the British Isles south uh, or out, outside excuse me, of Ireland, the Isle of Man, and a few other smaller islands identified as Celts until the 1700s. When the Welsh linguist and scholar Edward Lloyd recognized the similarities between languages like Welsh, Irish, Cornish, the now extinct Gaulish, and labeled them Celtic. Had Ireland and those few other smaller islands not held strong, a lot more of a Celtic culture and tradition would have been lost to history. All right, now, now let's talk uh, more about uh, uh, Celtic religion. Celtic religion was closely tied to the natural world and they worshiped their pantheon of gods in what they called sacred places like lakes, uh, rivers, cliffs, and bushes. Uh, very much a woodsy, crunchy, outdoorsy religion. The Celts were like ancient uh, Vermont hippies. If those hippies, when not chilling out in the woods, you know, love to head over to uh, New Hampshire or Massachusetts, you know, from time to time and just uh, lop some fucking heads off. Uh, the moon, the sun, the stars, especially important to the Druids as they thought that they were uh, supernatural forces in every aspect of the natural world. Archaeologists, or they, you know, they saw supernatural aspects in every aspect of the natural world. Uh, archaeologists believed that the Iron Age Celts had a ton of gods and goddesses and that the Celts worshipped their gods through sacrifice, giving them valuable objects to keep them happy. Uh, but material treasures weren't the only sacrifices. The Iron Age Celts sacrificed uh, via killing animals, uh, even humans, to their gods. Maybe humans. You know, is that a fact or is that just propaganda written by those who fought them uh, or those who, you know, converted them into Christianity? The Celts also sacrificed weapons to the gods by throwing them into lakes, rivers, and bogs, places they considered, again, like magical, special. Uh, one particular site in Wales, uh, Lynn Kerig Bach, maybe, could not find a pronunciation for that place. Uh, archaeologists have found over 150 objects of bronze and iron, including spears, shields, and swords. That's pretty sweet. Uh, the Druids, as I said earlier, were in charge of Celtic religion, and sadly, we don't know a lot about them for certain. It's all secondhand knowledge. Uh, Julius Caesar, who conquered Gaul, is among the principal sources of information about Druids, and he didn't really care for them. He killed a lot of them. Uh, he wrote that they were the most educated and powerful members of the tribes, though, more, more than warrior chiefs in some ways, and were well-respected by other Celts. The Druids would travel between distant Celtic regions. They would pass on news, worship, camaraderie between tribes. Being able to warn other tribes about enemies like Rome, you know, made them frequent targets to be killed by the Romans. Uh, where did the Druids come from? How old are they? The earliest written reference to them dates back about 2,400 years. While Druidism is likely to go back much further in time than this, how far back is unknown. Ancient Druidism continued up until around 1,200 years ago, you know, gradually being, uh, you know, pushed out by Christianity. Uh, the ancient Greek writer Dio uh, Chrysostom, who lived about 1,900 years ago, compared Druids to the biblical uh, Magi, those wise men, and the Brahmins, the Hindu priests of India. He wrote, the Celts appointed those whom they called Druids, these also being devoted to the prophetic art and to wisdom in general. In one passage, the Roman historian and traveler, uh, Pliny the Elder, who lived almost 2,000 years ago, talks about the importance of mistletoe and the fifth day of the moon to the Druids. He said that mistletoe was gathered with rites replete with rit religious awe. This is done more particularly on the fifth day of the moon, the day which is the beginning of their months and years as also of their ages. Yes, the Christmas association of mistletoe is Celtic in origin. Uh, the Kel Celts would place a sprig of mistletoe above their, uh, you know, the door of their homes and its sacred nature prohibited fighting beneath it. And that evolved over the centuries into the custom of kissing underneath mistletoe at Christmas. Uh, mistletoe, a very sacred plant to the Druids, thought to ward off evil, restore health, bestow fertility. Not sure about all that. Uh, Western medicine currently uh, not sold on all these claims. Uh, the Celtic Druids believed that mistletoe was the essence of the sun god called uh, Tyrannus by the Gaul tribes of Celts, and any tree hosting mistletoe on its branches was marked sacred. Uh, Pliny also talks about the importance of animal sacrifice and fertility to the Druids. They bring thither two white bulls, the horns of which are bound then for the first time. Clad in a white robe, the priest ascends the tree and cuts the mistletoe with a golden sickle, which is received by others in a white cloak. Then they immolate the victims while offering prayers that's what Pliny the uh, Elder wrote. It is the belief with them that the mistletoe taken in drink will impart fertility to all the animals that are barren and that it is an antidote for all poisons. So uh, we get a lot of that information. Immolate uh, means to sacrifice typically via fire, by the way. Hopefully not in that case, but probably. Man, burning bulls seems crueler than slitting their throats. Uh, some historians believe that Druidism was founded in Britain, but again, not, no one's totally sure. Uh, no one's sure how widespread it was either. Uh, flourished in the British Isles and Gaul, though. 
based on archaeological digs. Uh, Julius Caesar claimed that Druidism originally came from Britain and that those who wished to study it in depth, you know, did travel there. As Christianity spread throughout Europe, Druidism gradually faded away. Druids uh, still present in Ireland as recently as the 8th century CE, but in a much more reduced form. And then, you know, then they were all gone. Uh, t- today, the term Druid conjures up uh, like, a, like a magician or wizard or something. Some Dungeons and Dragons shit. But really, that they were their culture's intellectuals. You know, leadership, spiritual glue that held their tribes together. In recent years, there has been a spiritualist resurgence of modern-day Druidism. But there's not much of a connection between modern Druidism and ancient Druidism because we don't know what the fuck they did. According to a guy with a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Aberdeen, who has studied Druidism for most of his adult life, you know, like the Druids, the Celts, written books on them, uh, Thorsten Geyser, Druidic, Druidic, there we go. Uh, rituals are best seen not as a set of formalized actions, but as a stance, an attitude, a particular mode of experience and perception, which gives rise to a feeling of being in the world, of being part of nature. You know, so it's, uh, it's you know, it's, we don't know what they did. It's just more of like, ah, they were just, they like, they like Mother Earth. And we know that they wore some stuff that looked kind of like this. And they probably worshipped, you know, some of these gods, but who knows which band of Celts did and whatever. I, I read all that as like modern day Druids are, and I'm not trying to sound overly cond- condescending here, but they're, there's people who love nature and Celtic culture, and when they're, you know, turning that into Druidism, they're kind of engaging in, a, in, in something like akin to cosplay, right? Let's put on some robes, Celtic jewelry, head out to a Celtic archaeological site, chant in Gaelic, think about nature, Mother Earth, reference some Celtic gods, feel in touch with the universe, and, you know, tell ourselves that we're Druids. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do. I know it's inflammatory. Have fun if that's what you want. Uh, if it makes you feel good, fuck, yeah, fucking do it. But just, you know, say, the, you know, just know that what you're doing is, is not repeating ancient Druid incantations, right? And prayers, because we don't know what, we don't know what those are. They've been lost to history. You know, if I put on a robe and went out to some Celtic ruins in Ireland and had enough, you know, psilocybin or something in my system, I bet I would fucking feel like a Druid. It'd probably be a lot of fun. Maybe Nimrod would appear before me. Maybe I'd, maybe I'd see a Selkie lady or a Banshee or something. Uh, we do know from the writings of their enemies that at the center of the beliefs of the Druids and the Celts as a whole, there are several gods and goddesses and other crazy characters uh, who we'll meet soon. Uh, before we meet all the weird creatures of the grasslands and the bogs, let's take a second to look at another key aspect of the Celtic religion uh, that they were, you know, uh, largely born out of these creatures, uh, their holidays or, you know, associated with their gods and stuff. It was a huge part of a Celtic person's life and a couple of these you might have heard of. In Ireland, there are eight important sacred Celtic holidays of the year, each one still celebrated today with many traditional rituals and activities carried out, not only in Ireland, but in other Celtic regions around the world. And uh, a lot of crossover here with paganism, not associated with Celtic traditions. Crossover with Wiccan celebrations, and again, because of the traditions coming from a collection of tribes who did not write shit down, holy fucking telephone game, uh, the definition of these holidays is going to vary a little bit from one source to the next. I'm just trying to save myself some angry emails with that disclaimer. Trying to keep from getting hexed by a, by a wicked witch or something. Uh, first is Beltane. Beltane is a fire festival. It celebrates the first day of summer according to Celtic tradition. It's the Gaelic May Day Festival. Beltane is a Celtic word, which means fires of Bel. Bel, a.k.a. Belenos, a Celtic deity called the fair shining one or the shining god, the lord of light. We must follow the lord of light. I'm still thinking about Game of Thrones. He was one of the most ancient and uh, most widely worshipped Celtic deities. He was associated with the horse and wheel, perhaps like Apollo. Uh, Belenos was, uh, you know, thought to ride the, the sun across the sky in a horse-drawn chariot. Most burial tomb inscriptions referencing Bel come from Gaul. Some Celts there would uh, inscribe words here and there with his name in, uh, in Latin after meeting the Romans. Uh, May Day fairs were once popular where farmers would trade products and host festivals where people partied, welcomed the long days of summer. In the pagan traditions, Beltane's a fertility celebration with the phallic symbol of the maypole being danced around by maidens. Oh, mm-hmm. Okay, now I get it. Uh, traditionally, those uh, that the tribe felt were, you know, ready for procreation. It said that many tribes, men and women would go off into the woods and fuck as part of the celebration. So yeah, that sounds fun. Sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds uh, almost like an ancient version of some kind of Woodstock or Coachella-like music festival, but with, you know, even more sex. Holy some drugs. Hey, Lucifina. In Ireland, Beltane mentioned in some of the earliest Irish literature going back to the 8th century CE, associated with the important events in Irish mythology. Uh, also known as First of Summer. It marked the beginning of summer, and it was when cattle were driven out to the summer pastures, rituals performed to protect cattle, crops, and people, and to encourage growth uh, were, you know, taken part in. Special bonfires were kindled, and their flames, smoke, and ashes were deemed to have protective power. The people and their cattle would walk around or between bonfires, sometimes leap over the flames or embers. 
I mean, I doubt the fucking cows did that. Probably just the people were doing the fire leaping, but who knows? Maybe they had some bovine whispers who were so talented they could get cows to jump over fire, which is a cool trick. Uh, all, all household fire, all household fires would be doused and then relit from the Beltane bonfire in the community. These gatherings would be accompanied by a feast. Uh, some of the food and drink would be offered to Irish fairies, also known as the good folk or the little people, or by a bunch of other Gaelic terms my brain has no clue how to pronounce. Uh, we'll get into fairies later. Love that they would make offer- offerings to fairies, and not in a symbolic way, in a, these creatures are real, and we don't want to fucking piss them off, Lord of the Rings kind of way. Doors, windows, buyers, and livestock would be uh, decorated with yellow mayflower, may flowers, perhaps because they evoked fire. In parts of Ireland, people would make a may bush, Typically a thorn bush or branch decorated with flowers, ribbons, bright shells, and rush lights. Springs thought to be sacred were also visited. The water and Beltane dew thought to be magical to bring beauty and maintain youthfulness. A lot of nature worship, a lot of magic. Celtic religion and mythology, what we do know about it, uh, very nature-centric, very Mother Earth-focused. June 21st, the summer solstice, solstice is the next Celtic holiday. It has a ton of names, from Midsummer to Letha, to so many other, how the fuck do you say that in Gaelic terms? Which mean uh, the light of the shore, light of summer. In Gaelic solstice means sun stop. This refers to the fact that in the few days before and after the solstice, the sun appears to stop in the sky, rising and setting at the same point on the horizon. This day's the longest of the year, celebrating light and sun, associated with flowers, herbs, candles. Uh, the Celts dedicated this day to a Celtic goddess who went by so many different names, it is ridiculous. Usually, usually uh, Ideen or Attain in Ireland, uh, known in Wales uh, primarily as Rhiannon. Sometimes she gets mixed up, uh, matched together with some other Celtic gods and goddesses for extra fun. Uh, Attain often uh, called the Shining One. She was originally a sun goddess before becoming a moon goddess. And then she was a white lady. And I don't know, she might have also worked at Burger King for a while. Maybe been a fry cook, perhaps a masseuse at a fucking, uh, I don't know. A pl- place in Dublin, maybe maybe Shepherd's Pie at a pub for a little while. A lot of variations on her legend. She was a goddess of love, transformation, rebirth. Elements sacred to attain are the sun, dawn, the sea, rain, water, uh, butterflies. Seems like a drop down. Yeah, you have the you, you, have, you have you are powerful. You have powers of the sun. We must pray. We must pray to you to make the sun rise and to ha- and to have the sea not flood us and for the rain to come down and also for butterflies are cool. Uh, also associated with apple blossoms and swans, uh, associated with healing, the transmigration of souls. Uh, the summer solstice believed to be the ideal time of year, given the abundance of light that was present for the druids to banish evil spirits. G- go on, get out, get out here, Banshee. Go on, get. Come on, get out here, Baylor. Get out of here, Carmen. I see you, Kelpie. Get out, go on, get now. Uh, marking the uh, beginning of the harvest season, August 1st is the next holiday, Lunasa. The holiday is halfway between the autumn equinox, the summer solstice, one of the four Gaelic seasonal festivals, along with uh, Samhain, Imbolc, and Beltane. Celebrations still exist to this day, include festivals, traditional music, hopefully not this. I mean, is that the best guy or is that the worst guy? It's hard to tell. Uh, arts and crafts, dancing, and parades. And it's another excuse to party. Lunasa is uh, mentioned in some of the earliest Irish literature and has pagan origins. Uh, the festival itself, named after the Celtic god Lu. Lu, the primary god in Celtic culture. Or, what, excuse me, was a primary god. I misspoke there. Uh, sometimes known as the sun god, a trickster god, the Celtic Mercury, god of war, etc. Lu generally portrayed in art as a warrior, a king, a master craftsman. Uh, sometimes a savior associated with skill and mastery in multiple disciplines, including the arts. Powerful God. The next holiday is called Maybon, which is the second harvest festival, which also revolves around the stars and falls on September 21st. Uh, we call it the autumn equinox. Traditionally known as the stepping stone between light and dark, meaning at this time of the year, there's an equal amount of both. It's a time for harvest when people would gather stores, start to preserve all their food, you know, to keep them going during the winter. Uh, during Maybon, the Druids and Celtic practitioners of, uh, you know, their religion remembered the abundance they had received during the harvest season by giving offerings back to the land. Next comes Samhain, right? What turned into Halloween. Between October 31st and November 1st, uh, spelled Samhain, pronounced Samhain. So that's cool. Thanks for making it easy, Celts. Uh, marking the end of the harvest seasons and the beginning of the winter. This day is celebrated with bonfires and rituals thought to have cleansing and protective powers. The Druids believed Samhain was a time when the veil between uh, the darkness and the light was the thinnest, between the realms of the living and the dead. All sorts of various spirits could ramble into our world, right? Uh, 
I guess amble more is probably word that would be better for that uh, context uh, and cause all sorts of trouble. Halloween is steeped in this Celtic tradition as uh, both are celebrated on the same day, focused on the dead. During Samhain, the Celts would dress up to play a trick on neighbors called guising, which would consist of them reciting a poem, singing a song, telling a joke with the hopes of reward in the form of a treat. Uh, carving faces into pumpkins or the uh, jack-o'-lantern also started with the Celts, but they would carve scary faces into turnips instead of pumpkins. Some sources say they would place candles within them, must have been some big turnips, uh, leave them out away from their front door because they believe spirits would be attracted to the light coming from them and not come into their homes. All right, some sources uh, don't believe they lit fires in them, but, you know, would still be attracted to the carved turnip because spirits were super dumb, I guess, and could mistake a carved turnip for, I don't know, an angry human face or another spirit or something. I love shit like that. We must be careful. These evil spirits are very powerful. And they possess uh, incredible magic that can easily kill us. If we do not want these sentient, malevolent, powerfully magical creatures to find us, we must carve uh, faces into uh, turnips with uh, candles in them. And that that will trick them. And they'll be like, oh, they're gonna, I'll haunt this guy, I guess. Or no, I'm so scared of that guy's face is mean. But <laughs> we're like, nah, later we can joke about it. Like, no, but that was a turnip. But they're like, those are, I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. Uh, after Samhain comes the winter solstice on December 21st, uh, sometimes called midwinter or Celtic midwinter. Uh, in Gaelic, it's called, get the fuck out of there. Are those even real letters? Uh, this is the shortest day and longest night of the year. And from this day forward, the days become longer. In Celtic tradition, it's a time of rebirth, uh, which people celebrate by performing rituals, attending gatherings and festivals, drinking and partying, kind of the theme of uh, all eight of these at a fundamental level. New Grange, a 52-year... 5,200-year-old monument in Ireland, an extremely popular place to visit from December 19th to December 23rd. Uh, That's when the sun will shine through a gap into an ancient burial chamber. This cool event takes place at dawn, lasts for up to 17 minutes, like something out of some kind of Indiana Jones movie. Then on February 1st comes St. Bridget's Day, marking the first day of spring, represented by St. Bridget, uh, Bridget, uh, Ireland's first native saint who died in 625 CE. Obviously Catholic here, not Celtic, but the holiday has Celtic origins. Uh, It's a feast day generally associated with the symbol of a straw or a red cross, like a straw cross or a red cross. Uh, To Druids, St. Bridget's Day was known as Imbolc, marked the beginning of spring. Imbolc uh, mentioned in several early Irish manuscripts, but they say very little about its original rites and customs. Uh, We do know Imbolc was believed to be when uh, Kyloch, mother of wolves, queen of winter, the veiled one, the divine hag of Gaelic tradition, a deadly Celtic goddess gathers her firewood for the rest of the winter. We must, we must follow the Lord of Light. Uh, legend has it that if she wishes to make the winter last a, a good while longer, she'll, she'll make sure that the weather on Imbolc is bright and sunny so she can gather plenty of firewood. Therefore, people would be relieved if Imbolc was a day of foul weather as that meant that Kylock was asleep and that winter was almost over. She, was, she wasn't worried about it. Uh, then once Ireland was solidly into its Catholic days, the holiday remained associated with weather divination. Is it going to be a good year or a bad year for the crops? Uh, Are serpents and badgers, are they leaving their winter dens yet or not? And it's a precursor to Groundhog's Day in North America. Much cooler, darker, you know, uh, hot evil goddess version of Groundhog's Day. Uh, Many, based on pictures I saw. Many people celebrate the day now by visiting St. Bridget's Holy Well in Clare, Ireland. Housed in an open stone house or grotto that serves as a gateway to the ancient cemetery on the hill above it. Spooky looking little place. Uh, The graveyard is the final resting place of several mythical kings and clan leaders in Ireland. Looks like an awesome place to visit. And people who don't or can't visit this well, uh, they can celebrate by doing uh, some spring cleaning, some feasting, making some uh, traditional crosses. Uh, The final Celtic holiday is the spring equinox, March 20th. Modern Celts tend to call it uh, Ostara. And it seems to be the obvious pagan forerunner for today's Christian Easter celebration. The official name that the Celts call the holiday is not known, but because it is believed to be related to the northern goddess Ostara, the goddess of spring and dawn, amongst other things, the name Ostara associated with the holiday today. Spring equinox was a solar festival celebrating the time when the day and night are of equal length. And during Celtic times, eggs were used uh, as a symbol of rebirth and the beginning of new life. And a hare or rabbit was a symbol of the goddess and fertility. And that is why rabbits and eggs are associated with Easter today. Started with Ostara before there was Jesus. All these holidays help mark the passage of time for the Celts, determine the seasons, give structure to ancient Celtic life. Many, of course, associated with food and, you know, revelry, uh, but also like when to grow food, when to harvest it, 
You know, there were reasons for the tribes to gather together, party, strength, and social ties. What culture has not had a lot of holidays and celebrations? It just gives us meat sacks, something to look forward to, and it reinforces our tribalism. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, not one of the Celtic holidays. No association with Celtic tradition. Uh, actually helps mark the end of Celtic traditions with the beginning of Catholicism. You know, celebrating the arrival of Christianity. Now in uh, many countries, it's supposed to be a celebration of Irish life and heritage, but uh, really it's just become a, an excuse to get fucking hammered. So not including that one in, in this particular narrative. Now, now let's really dig into the, the mythology. But before I do, big note, <laughs> uh, the pronunciation of these characters, ho ho, very tricky. And not just for me this time. I'm not just making an excuse, I promise. Uh, these gods are all Celtic, but come from old, ancient Celtic mythology. Generally from Ireland, not always though. Sometimes from Wales, England, you know, present day France, uh, you know, etc. Most of the names are Gaelic, Old Gaelic. I watch a stupid amount of pronunciation videos. And for a lot of the characters, even when the videos are being presented by people who present themselves as native speakers, you listen to three different supposed Celtic experts name the same god or goddess or hero or monster, and the pronunciations vary wildly. Uh, people in the comment sections arguing uh, their ideas of how the words are, you know, supposed to be said very wildly, like like the most variants of any topic I've ever covered. More disagreement than even with the Norse mythology. Uh, if you have a doctorate in both Gaelic and Celtic mythology, you could probably say all these correctly. And thanks a lot for not making any good videos for me to find, you fucking dick. Uh, if you don't, save your emails in this regard, or at least watch five different videos with five different people saying the word. You're positive on butchering uh, before you waste your time. Fun subject today, but we're dealing with old words, old gods, creatures who show up in many different versions and forms in, you know, many different, you know, Celtic regions. So much telephone game. Uh, may Nimrod guide my mush mouth as best he can. And I'm sure I'm going to mess up some words that are agreed upon as well. Okay. <laughs> Conscience clear. Now, here we go. Uh, Celtic mythology is a collection of histories and legends measured in four distinct chronological cycles. They are the mythological, Ulster, Fenian, and historical cycles. Each have distinct properties and time periods. And many of the cycles feature the same characters, but the characters, you know, change. Uh, maybe they start off as warriors, turn into gods. Uh, maybe their powers vary, you know, uh, considerably from cycle to cycle, from one tribe of Celts to another, you know, not confusing at all. Uh, of course, it's confusing. Uh, you know, again, oral tradition, Celtic culture, not cohesive, uh, and Christianity. This is an important note. When the Catholics came to the British Isles and other Celtic areas, they fucked up all the lore. That's what all the historians think. That they bent the stories around, you know, gods got turned into warriors, kings, queens, witches, monsters, etc. A lot of creatures got demonized more than they, much more than they probably were. Uh, missionaries couldn't get rid of all this mythology without enraging Celtic locals who outnumbered them and risking an uprising. But they also, following their religion, could not let other gods exist as gods. Because that was, you know, antithetical to Christian belief. So they twisted the characters uh, to suit their own ends. Massaged a lot of these stories. Okay, let's get these cycles out. The mythological cycle was the first era of ancient Irish folklore and as a result, the least documented. Also contains some of the most important Celtic figures. Stories from the mythological cycle center on gods and the first settlers on the island of Ireland. Seven main groups, two of which we'll cover in some you know, detail today. Uh, there isn't really an true origin story, but if there was, it would be in this cycle. Uh, the Ulster cycle was the second cycle of Irish mythology. Uh, most of these tales originate from or before the first century CE, uh, you know, which tells you uh, how old the first cycle is. Uh, the, the first cycle is uh, the most prominent hero of this cycle is the demigod Ku Kulain. For, uh, for the Ul Ulster cycle, many of its myths take place in the provinces of Ulster and Connacht uh, and center around births and death, training and battle in the Irish countryside. There are many tales from the cycle featuring kings, heroes, uh, gods, friends, foes, tons of magic. The Fenian cycle, the third wave of Irish mythological text. Uh, like its predecessor, the Ulster Cycle, it's focusing on heroes, heroines, stories generally based in the regions of Leinster and Munster. For whatever reason, uh, stories from this cycle, just where the people were writing them, uh, stories from this cycle center on the uh, Fianna, a band of independent warriors, and their leader, Finn McCool. We'll meet Mr. McCool. Uh, and the historical cycle is the last cycle of mythology, and stories from this time blend, you know, factual history and people with legends and tall tales. Now, hence the name historical cycle. Uh, folklore from this cycle includes real figures in Irish history doing not real shit, as well as purely mythological creatures all woven together. Uh, there's one main story here worth noting. It's the story of uh, Bule Sweeney, written in the 12th century in both uh, verse and prose. It tells the uh, story of curses and supernatural powers, often called the frenzy of Sweeney, the madness of Sweeney, where the mad Swe Sweeney er, you know, comes from, about a pretty uh, or a petty king, Sweeney, who loses his mind on a battlefield. 
Stories have him walking across Ireland from treetop to treetop, uh, eventually converting to Christianity, and we'll explore that. Okay. Uh, all of the myths from all four cycles are collections of secondhand fanciful tales at best. Uh, let's go through each of the different cycles, you know, and uh, share a little bit from each one. Mostly from this first one. We'll start with the, uh, you know, the mythological cycle. Uh, buckle in. This is the wildest one. And this section will be by far the longest. Seven distinct groups make up the majority of the tales in the mythological cycle. They are the Tua, Tua de Donan, the Fomorians, Caesar, uh, Caesar, uh, possibly, uh, Partholonians, the Firbalics, the Nemedians, and the Milesians. We're going to focus on two of these seven. Here's what the other five are about. Uh, Caesar, that's how I, that's as close as my mouth will make it. Like, a, I know it's not like an instrument for cutting paper. It's C-E-S-S-A-I-R, but that's the best way I can say it. Caesar is a mythological uh, um, you know, figure in Irish folklore featured in an ancient medieval text. The Book of Invasions, the most important source in the world when it comes to Celtic mythology. This book is a, a collection of poems, and it's, a, it's like a figure and a people. Uh, the, the book, yeah, this book is a collection of poems, prose narratives in the Irish language intended to be a history of Ireland and the Irish from the creation of the world to the Middle Ages. It was compiled in the 11th century by an anonymous writer very likely a Catholic monk or several monks, almost with certainty. And they compiled the compiled texts that go all the way back to the fifth century, uh, you know, writings written by earlier Christians in Ireland and Scotland. And scholars believe that the writer sought to create an epic written history comparable to that of the Israelites of the Old Testament in the Bible. Uh, this history intended to fit the Irish into Christian world chronology and connect them to Adam. So, you know, they took confusing stories and made them way more confusing by trying to mesh everything with Christian mythology. So it's a big Christian Celtic mashup. And and again, once again, the history of the Celts being written by their conquerors. Uh, The Fomorians were the first group to settle the island in this history their mythology. A bunch of evil freaks and monsters. More about them later. The uh, Partholonians, second group of settlers on the Emerald Isle, said to have introduced traditional activities such as farming, cooking, building. Uh, Nemedians told to be the third who settled Ireland. They arrived 30 years after the Partholonians died out and then became extinct not long after, according to the mythological cycle. Then came the Fir Balags, uh, who were the fourth to settle on the island of Ireland, said that the or Fir Balags uh, were descendants of the Nemids. They left Ireland, went to Greece, then came back. Uh, the Milesians are considered the last group to settle on the island of Ireland, Celts from present-day Spain who now represent the ancestors of modern Irish people said that on arrival, they, uh, you know, contended with the, uh, Tua de Danan, some God folk who descended from the Numidians way too much to cover to get into all these. So we're going to look at, you know, two in depth, the, uh, Tua de Danan and the Fomorians. And then later I'll go over the other three cycles and cover a few, you know, uh, gods, some Irish mythological and folklore creatures, uh, that are just interesting and fun. And then I didn't mention it earlier, but also it to the internet. I don't think I mentioned it. Uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann are the most widely remembered supernatural race who lived in the other world of Irish folklore in the mythological cycle. Uh, the other world is the Celtic realm of deities and possibly also the dead, usually described as a supernatural realm of everlasting youth, beauty, health, abundance, and joy. Uh, mm, similar to a parallel universe, various mythological heroes visit it either through chance or being invited by one of its residents. They often reach it by entering ancient burial mounds or caves or by going underwater or across the Western Sea. Sometimes the other world is said to exist alongside our own, located beyond the edge of the earth, intrudes into our world, uh, signaled by phenomena such as magic mist uh, that the Tuadanan or Tuadanan could enshroud themselves with, right? That enchanted looking Irish fog is how they're interpreting this. Uh, Could also be signaled by sudden changes in weather, by the appearance of divine beings or unusual animals. An otherworldly woman might invite the hero uh, of a story into the other world. Fuck yeah, she would. Uh, I interpret that as ancient horny Celts, probably, you know, um, you know, using that maybe as an excuse to to, to blame, uh, you know, cheating on the gods or something. Like, what? What? She was a real woman? From From the next village? Are you serious? I swear, baby, I thought she was a goddess. I thought I, I thought for sure she was an otherworld goddess. And you know, we can't upset the gods. And I just thought I was I was doing my, you know, religious duty. She, she used magic. She used magic to trick me. Uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann show up in a lot of old stories based in Irish mythology, often called the tribe of the gods. Most pagan gods in pre-Christian Ireland are in this group. According to that book of invasions, the Tuatha Dé Danann came to Ireland on flying ships surrounded by dark clouds, traveling by magic, gotta be the best way to travel. Uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann regularly associated with archaeological sites like Newgrange, other ancient sites in Ireland, key part of Irish folklore. Uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann mean um, also, it can mean the folk of the goddess 
uh, Danu. And in the mythology, they invaded and ruled Ireland over 4,000 years ago. Uh, Danu, one of the oldest mythical beings in Ireland. The mother of the gods, the earth mother goddess, often portrayed as a beautiful woman. Hail Lucifina. Uh, those sculptors who carved her, uh, you know, old idols, man, they must have had boners while they were doing that because they knocked it out of the park with her image. Uh, this Celtic goddess commonly associated with nature, uh, mother earth. Uh, I might've met her when I did some DMT. Also represented aspects of regeneration, wind, wisdom, death, and prosperity. And according to ancient document known as uh, the Annals of the Four Masters compiled by Franciscan monks between 1632 and 1636, uh, from some earlier text, the Tua de Donan ruled from their parallel universe. Uh, they ruled in this universe from 1897 BC until 1700 BC. Not very long for how important they are and how powerful, you know. Those, mink, those monks trying to diminish their godliness. Uh, these gods were said to have originated from four mythical northern cities, possibly located in Norway. Uh, although the Tua de Donan lived in the other world, they interacted and engaged with those living in the real human world. The Tua de Donan were frequently featured in the writings of Christian monks. And again, uh, a lot of liberties, you know, taken to shape their stories. Uh, some of these writings, the Tua de Donan referred to as queens and heroes who possessed magical powers. Other times, mainly more recently, you know, they referred to as Celtic gods and goddesses. Uh, the Tua de Donan hailed from a land that granted all those that lived there everlasting youth called uh, Tir Nanag. Maybe this is not really actually confirmed anywhere in older texts in Irish mythology. Uh, the Tir Nanag comes from a later mythological cycle, but it seems to be the consensus today that the Tir Nanag is the home of the Tua de Donan because later people said so. This is all set up today's idiots of the internet. Very well, by the way, a lot of people in the comment sections under this stuff. Oh man, speak with so much certainty. I'm jealous. They read one top 10 list or, you know, one book. Uh, now they know everything about some aspect of Celtic lore. I've learned this week that arguing over a lot of Celtic mythology makes about as much sense as arguing over what your dreams mean. Uh, resetting a bit here now, in the majority of Celtic mythology tales, when the Tua de Danann made their way into Irish soil, the mighty Firbolag were already the leaders of Ireland, right? The, the fourth group to settle Ireland. The first three, the people of uh, Cizre, the people of Partholon, and the people of Nemed, they were wiped out or forced to abandon the island. The Firbolag, said to be the descendants of the people of Nemed, and the Tua, <laughs> Tua de Donan, also said to be the descendants of Nemed. This is weird. All but 30 of the Nemed were at one point killed in wars and disasters. And then some of them, apparently the stronger ones, went on to Britain. And they became, over time, the Tua de Donan. They became gods. And then the other weaker ones went to Greece. And then they came back as the Firbolag. But then they got stronger. They came back first. They controlled the island. And then the stronger ones from Britain, the god dude and god ladies, they came back to fuck up their cousins. This plays out like a fucking fever dream. The Tua de Donan made their way over to the west coast of Ireland, demanded that the Fearblog surrender half their land, right? Which is an interesting stance for god people. Be like, hey, we don't need it all. Let's take half. And then the Fearblog refused. They didn't want to give him one acre. And, uh, you know, they'd come to regret that. This refusal led to the first battle of Mig Trig. The Celtic version of ancient Greek tales of the gods fighting the gods before them, like the Titans. And in this great, full of monsters and magic and giants battle, the Fear Balag will be defeated, but not easily. The Tua de Donan, led by King Nuada, first king of the gods. You may remember him from Hellboy 2. Not kidding. Prince Nuada in that movie, loosely based on this old Celtic legend. Uh, Nuada was their first king, was married to uh, Boyan, a river goddess, or Bo yeah, Boyan, river goddess. And during the battle, one of the Fear Balag managed to cut off the arm of King Nuada, which resulted in the kingship being turned over to a tyrant named Bress. Because everybody knows you can't have a one-armed king, apparently. Uh, Dian Ket, god of healing and son of another god, Dogda, powerful god possessing the power over both life and death associated with fertility, agriculture, magic, and druidry, magically replaces Nuada's lost arm, fucking presto changeo, fuck yeah, bro, new arm, and the new one's made of silver, and he's pronounced king again. Huh. Seems like a heavy arm. Seems like a heavy-ass arm to try and carry around in battle. But, you know, better than no arm, maybe. Uh, the silver arm shit would not last very long, right? Uh, Miach, uh, I don't know how to say his name, son of uh, Dian Ket, also a member of the Tua de Danan, not happy that the Nuwada was given the crown. And he was some kind of goddish wizard motherfucker. And he used a spell that made flesh now grow over Nuwada's shiny replacement arm. And then Dian Ket, furious about what his son did to Nuwada, and then he kills him. He didn't like being upstage, and I get it. We've all been here as parents. Right? You make a warrior, king, god dude, wizard fucker, a silver arm. And then your son, without even talking to you, makes the guy a new arm. It's fucking better. 
he just to be a dick and you have to kill him. Uh, it was this time that Bress, who was temporarily the king while Nuwata lost his arm, complained to his father, Elah. Elah was king of the Formorians, supernatural race in Celtic mythology. Next group we're going to cover. And Elah was maybe a minor sun god dude, possibly a god of storytelling, maybe good at Scrabble. Who knows? Uh, Elah sent Bress to help, uh, to get help from Baylor, another king who will become a monster later of the Fomorians. Uh, he will mutate into a race of giants. And Baylor the king, will turn into a big one-eyed motherfucker known as Baylor the Smiter, Baylor of the Evil Eye, Baylor of the Piercing Eye. Reminds me a lot of the, uh, the Eye of Sauron from Lord of Rings. Uh, the two Edidonan then hold a council. They decide it's going to be best to make their peace with the Fomorians because fucking Baylor is scary shit. They don't want to be annihilated even though they're god people. But then later, the two uh do fight another great battle. The second battle of Maig Turek against the Fomorians. They're like, we, we do want to fight you, actually. And then Nuwata is killed by the Fomorian king, Baylor's poisonous eye. Uh, but then Baylor gets killed by Lu, champion of the two Edidonin, who slings a fucking rock into his big evil poison eye and takes over his king. And then later, these god warriors fight a third great battle against the Milesians, a Gaelic people from the northwest of the Iberian Peninsula, last group from the ancient days, and the ancestors of modern Gaelic peoples in the British Isles. And the Milesians will not be defeated, right? One of their bards and druids somehow negotiates the truth with the god people, the Tui de Donan, and then those people decide, okay, we'll get to live in the other world of Ireland, Celtic realm of deities and possibly the dead again. And then the Milesians, we get to live in the mortal world of Ireland. And that is how it's been ever since without fucking question. Okay. That's why Ireland now has both regular people and magic people and leprechauns. And that is how you fucking, that's how you get enchanted meat sex with an ancient bard truce, one-eyed monster fallout situate mic drop. Okay. I hope that was all very concise and easily to understand because it is for me. <laughs> it makes it all makes perfect sense. It all makes perfect sense. A um, few other details about the Tuatha Dé before we move on. Some stories have them coming to Ireland, not on ships, you know, but just like like the flew through the crowd, clouds, but just regular ships. Uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann often described as tall gods, goddesses that have blonde or red hair, blue or green eyes, pale skin, right? Kind of like that classic D and D imagery for you know Celtic warriors and gods and goddesses. Uh, the Tuatha Dé have so many members I didn't mention who are Celtic gods, some more prominent than others in Irish mythology. Uh, you know, Dogda, another uh, Tuatha Dé and god. Maybe I mentioned uh, god, Dog, Dogda. It's all getting so blurry now. Uh, played a super important part in Celtic mythology. In a number of stories, Dogda or the Dogda, described as a large man or giant with a beard that owns uh, a club with magical powers. It's also said that the Dogda was a druid and a king, held the power to control everything from the weather to time. So that's sweet. The home of the Dodogda reported to be that ancient site in uh, Newgrange. Oh, and uh, also said to be the husband of the terrifying uh, Morrigan, shape-shifting goddess of war and death. Um, the Tuatha Dé Danann also had magic items I didn't mention. When they arrived in Ireland, they brought with them four treasures, right, from their four magic cities of Findius, Glorius, uh, Murius, and Folius. Each of the treasures of the Tuatha Dé Danann possessed incredible power that made them some of the most feared items in Celtic mythology. Uh, first, there was Dogda's cauldron. Dogda's mighty cauldron had the power to feed an army of men. Said it had the ability to leave no company unsatisfied. It can make super tasty food and as much as you want. And I bet that cauldron made some sweet-ass biscuits and gravy and really good shepherd's pie and probably amazing lemon meringue pie. Whatever you want. Low-calorie options would taste like regular options. Right? Cherry Coke has just the right amount of cherry syrup in it and not too much and it's carbonated not stale <laughs> it said that it have you know uh this came from the other world yeah city of murius and then uh there was the spear of lu the spear of lu one of the most feared weapons in all of celtic mythology once the spear was drawn no army could defeat the man who held the spear nor that man's army that's a dope ass spear you don't even have to throw it and you get to win more powerful than the spear of destiny right if you had that spear and that cauldron you, you just fucking use the spear to guard the cauldron. And you get to eat whatever you want, whenever you want, and no one can take that magic away from you. Uh, Glorious was the uh, otherworld city that the spear was said to come from. Glorious. Uh, another treasure, right? The gem uh, called the Stone of Fall, said to have come from the otherworld city of Folius. The Stone of Fall, believed to have been used to pronounce the High King of Ireland. According to legend, when a man worthy of kingship stood upon it, the stone would roar with happiness. That's weird. 
roar with happiness. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> and then you're like, ah, this, this guy gets to be king. Stone roared with happiness. Pretty cool, but not as cool as the first two. I mean, super fun to be king of Ireland, but cooler than perfect food every day and never having to be defeated in battle? I don't know. Speaking of swords, according to legend, when the sword of light, we must follow the lord of light, is removed from its holder, no opposing army can escape from it. In some stories from Celtic mythology, the sword resembles a bright glowing torch. That that one, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, the dude who, I'm just pulling this out of my ass right now, but uh, wrote the books that the, Oh my gosh, that the uh, show, The Game of Thrones is based on, you know, pulled from this mythology as as, as well as pulling from other mythologies, you know, to- Tolkien, a lot of people that are writing these modern Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, Game of Thrones, you know, building these worlds, they, they, they pulled from all this stuff. You can just see like the influences like, oh yeah, that's, that is from the Lord of Light. Uh, this sword, still not as cool as the other, uh, is the spear. That spear would fuck the sword up, right? If I get one thing, I get the spear, then I use the spear to take the other three things. Uh, let's really meet those Fomorians now. No recounting of ancient Irish myth could be complete without mentioning the Fomorians, dreaded foes of the Tua de Danann, and all who came to conquer Ireland. These ones in the Game of Thrones world, they, were, they would remind me of the White Walkers. The meaning of their name debated even today, though most agree that the first part, uh, you know, fa, means from below, nether. The latter part means probably sea, demons, or giants. Nether giants, sea, demons, something. And when you read of their deeds and doings, you know, that stuff is pretty on, on brand. They're fucking monsters. Some scholars believe their destructive nature mirrors that of natural phenomena. Descriptions of the Fomors or Fomorians, their behavior strange and conflicting in the old legend, of course. Some tales tell that they were phenomenally ugly and that they even celebrated this ugliness, driving out their children who were normal in appearance, taking deformities as a mark of favor from their dark gods. And I, that's weird, but I get it. Did you know that I once had two beautiful kids? Mm Mm-hmm, but I got rid of them. Too pretty, too handsome. It was distracting. Then later I had Kyler Monroe and I was like, yeah, they'll do. I can keep these freaks. Come on, JK. Uh, But not kidding about these monsters. One for more might have a large arm and a small arm while another might have two heads. The other has three eyes. Tales big on deformity. Uh, Other tales claim they were born whole enough, uh, but strange in mind. And uh, appearance after exposure to their occult practices would make them deformed. Some believe that they had the heads of goats, Others thought they were related to the fallen angels of Christian lore, right? The monks tried to connect them to the uh, Nephilim. Maybe it's giants. Uh, in the Labor Gabala Aaron, that book of invasions said they some uh, they're described as having like one leg, one eye, one arm. Some corners of the internet say this is a misunderstanding of the crane stance, right? Maybe they would stand that way when they're doing their fucking wizard spells. There were giant wizard warriors. Legends tell that they could control the weather, uh, mists, waves of the ocean. They could bring blight upon the crops, sickness upon cattle. You know, they could, they could, uh, and plague from their, excuse me, festering pits upon the people. Uh, the icy blasts of winter were theirs to command and deadly spirits from the underworld halls. Uh, they could summon to question, you know, up the, the past and the future. Uh, they could see, uh, they could do a kind of, they, they could do fucking all bad wizard magic. And Baylor, old evil eye, was one of their great kings and a popular Celtic folklore figure. And it was said his gaze could turn men to charred stone, right? Especially when he became, because he was like a, like a regular king dude in some of the stories, and then he was a big one-eyed giant in other stories. And when he was in his big one-eyed giant form, that's when he's the most terrifying. It would take four men to lift his fucking wizard eye lid. Uh, and he kept it closed while he's amongst his own, own folks. So I guess he's blind when he's hanging around his own people. And then he would also have it covered with seven cloaks to keep it, from doing some damage and I guess to keep it cool it would get overheated for some reason and when it was needed he would take these cloaks off one by one and he would fuck up so much shit you know he takes off with the first cloak now ferns begin to wither takes off his second eye cloak grass starts to get red third wooden trees get a little too hot a little too hot for people's liking fourth okay now the woods are smoking fifth boo everything's right on the edge of fire everything's getting red hot then he takes off the sixth and the seventh fucking everything's on fire that is some eyeball. With this eye, he was said to have blasted the islands west of Scotland, which according to legend remain bleak and haunted to this day because of that. But then, you know, someone slung a rock into his eye and that took him down. That feels plagiarized to me by the monks uh, taken from the story of David and Goliath. Uh, the Fomorians were the first in Ireland arriving with 200 men, 600 women, that's a solid ratio, surviving on, on uh, wild birds and fish and according to the legends may have been responsible for the building of many of the earliest 
megalithic monuments, you know, because they're giants. It was easier for them to build uh, stuff like Stonehenge. Uh, their king, Sickle Grisenchos, made war upon the people of a place called Parthalon, who arrived after the waters receded from a great flood. Monks, plagiarizing more of the Bible here. Uh, and then they defeated the Parthalonians with the deadly plague concocted in magic demon cauldrons. And that's as deep as we're going with, with, uh, with these guys here. We could spend a whole suck in their world, going over so many Gaelic names of old Fomorian kings and characters that will be as interesting and entertaining as me reading the book of Genesis from start to finish. Let's move on to the next three cycles. We're going to spend less time on these. Uh, the Ulster cycle, the second cycle of Irish mythology, comes from the first century CE. But since uh, none of this shit was written until the fifth century, who knows? Uh, said to come from the first century CE. More important than exactly uh, when this stuff happened is the subject matter. It's a body of heroic medieval legends and hero sagas. Perhaps the most famous is an early medieval epic called uh, Tan Bolkuli, which is commonly known as the Cattle Raid of Cooley, or the Tan. It's an epic uh, from early Irish literature. Earliest uh, complete copy comes from the 14th century, but referenced as existing way back in the 7th century, often called the Irish Iliad, and is seen as the gr- a groundbreaking piece of early Irish storytelling. Uh, it's huge, so we're not going to, you know, just go start plowing through it all. Essentially, tells a tale of a war between two Irish territories, Ulster and Connaught, uh, led by Queen Maeve and her husband, Alil, who are intent on stealing this super fucking cool bull, Don Quayle, the brown bull of Cooley, very fertile, big penis, big old clean ween, important cow. Due to a curse upon the king and the warriors of Ulster, the invaders are opposed only by a teenage demigod named Cuculin. And Cuculin is believed to be an incarnation of the Irish god Lu, who also happens to be his dad. Okay, Cuculin, both helped and hindered by supernatural figures from the children of Dan, who are the, uh, uh, you know, those people we were talking about earlier, the, the race of the, the gods that came on the island. They, they show up by different names. In the end, the bull lives longer than everyone trying to kill him, so that's nice, but then eventually does die of exhaustion. So, okay. Next cycle. The third wave of the Celtic mythological cycles, the Fenian cycle, the story is generally based in the regions of uh, Leinster, Munster, that revolve around the uh, Fianna, a band of independent warriors, and their leader, Old Finn McCool. Finn is connected to many leg- legends of the Fenian cycle. He's a, he's a star. He first came to prominence in his origin story of the Salmon of Knowledge. And that's the story I'll tell. One of the most popular in all the tales from this cycle. And the title makes it sound like one of my lies. I love that it's actually called the Salmon of Knowledge. Like all the rest of the Celtic myths, uh, several versions. This version, I think the most popular, tells the tale of a young Finn McCool many years before he became the leader of the uh, Fianna, back when he was just a boy. And all begins when he's uh, taken as an apprentice by a widely celebrated druid poet named Finnegus. One day, this poet tells Finn, maybe not a druid, some, well, again, some stories say he's not. Some stories say he's not. Uh, one day, this poet Finn, or the poet tells Finn the story of the salmon of knowledge and that if caught, it could make any man or woman the most intelligent person in Ireland. On one super sunny spring morning, McCool and the old poet are sitting by the edge of the river Boyne. And it was while they sit there that the, with their feet dangling over the water that Finnegus recounts the story of the salmon of knowledge to Finn. The story had been passed to Finnegus by an old druid. The druid had explained that there was a magic as fuck salmon that lived in the murky waters of the river. The druid believed that the salmon had devoured several nuts from a magical hazel tree that had grown near the river. Once the nuts began to digest in the fish's belly, the wisdom of the world was given to it. And that would suck. I mean, to be so smart, but still be a salmon, right? I mean, how much, uh, you know, is there to do to enrich your mind in the, in the river to entertain your brain? There's no books. The scenery doesn't change that much, you know? Always have to fight the current, never get to eat chocolate, mostly just fucking larva and smaller fish or something. If I have to be a salmon, I want to be so dumb. So I don't know what I'm missing. Uh, and actually the salmon holds the key to all the wisdom, but maybe isn't that smart itself. If it were, I guess it would have never got ta- caught in the first place. Uh, Finnegus tells Finn that the person who eats the salmon is going to gain all this knowledge. Boom, old Finn dog wants that salmon now. The elderly poet has spent many years gauged into the river in an attempt to spot and catch the salmon of knowledge, but never went ham and just fucking dove in after that fucker. Uh, then one day while he and Finn are sitting by the river Boyne, he sees a glint of an eye peering up from the water below. He knows it's that special magic salmon. He dives into the water. He manages to grab it. He's a quick poet. Fuck yeah, Finnegus. Then he gives the fish to Finn like an idiot and asks him to cook it for him. The poet has waited for years for this moment and is now worried, though, that Finn will betray him. He tells Finn, under no circumstance, do you eat even the tiniest sliver of that fish? Finnegus then leaves as he needs to fetch something that can't be even close to this important from his house. And Finnegus, again, he sounds like a fucking idiot. Just eat it raw. 
little salmonella is going to be worth it. It's a magic fish. He should have eaten it like a grizzly bear just before getting out of the water, but he didn't. He gave it to McCool. Finn did what was asked, repairs the fish. After a couple minutes, the salmon is uh, baking away on top of a searing hot stone set above a small fire. Salmon has been cooking for a number of minutes when McCool decides to turn it over, right? And sure, he's uh, properly cooking it for his poet buddy and uh, poet, you know, uh, uh, leader. And, and uh, God dang it. Uh, I'm blanking on all the words today because I'm uh, too much gaily coming. Mentor, there we go. So then he does. He turns it over, but ouchie, it's so hot. And he burns his thumb a little bit when he touches the knowledge meat. And he, without even thinking, he's like, oh, ouchie. Mm. And he like puts the thumb in his mouth to ease the pain. And that's when he fucked up. Right? Because now he got a little bit of that salmon, just a, just the tiniest trace of meat in his mouth. And when Finnegus returns, he knows something's different. He asks McCool what happened. You know, all is revealed. After taking a moment to mull the situation over, he's not mad for some reason. He tells Finn, all right, you, now you're just going to have to eat the rest, I guess. To see if it's going to, you know, grant you the wisdom uh, now that you've tasted it. Because now I can't have it because you, you tainted it. Finn hurriedly devoured the fish. Nothing happens. Now they're like, what's going on? So now Finn decides to stick his thumb in his mouth again. And for some reason, that's when everything changes. He puts his thumb back in his mouth, feels a surge of energy, and he has all the wisdom from the magic hazel tree salmon belly. And the wisdom is, uh, you know, makes him the wisest man in all of Ireland. And he grows up to be a great ancient warrior. And that's why and he's still famous today. So that's the best. That's the best story from that era. All right. Uh, the last cycle of Celtic mythology is the historical cycle. And it features some real Irish figures doing some totally unreal shit. Most notable story here, the one of Will Swibney. I think I said Will Sweeney earlier. It's Will Swibney, also known as Mad Sweeney. 12th century narrative known in English as the Frenzy of Sweeney or the Madness of Sweeney. And uh, English pronunci pronunciations for the Gaelic words in this story are particularly difficult to find. So I'm probably going to butcher some of these. Uh, the third and best known of a trilogy about a 7th century Ulster king, Sweeney, who would lose his mind in battle. Sweeney, son of Coleman, a king in eastern Northern Ireland, thought to be a real dude or at least based on a real dude, seeks to expel the evangelizing St. Ronan Finn from his kingdom, but his wife... Oren dissuades him. Angry at the sound of Ronan's bell, Sweeney rushes from his castle one day. But then Oren grabs his cloak so that he uh, goes through the door naked. Great. Now he's running out there naked. And then the pagan king, he's like, well, fuck it. I'm not going to go back inside. I'm already outside. I'm mad. So I'm just going to run over to Ronan's uh, uh, church and, uh, and take his book of Psalms and then toss it into a lake. And then he does that and he's about to fucking beat his ass. Maybe kill the guy. When Then all of a sudden someone's like, hey, we got a battle that has to start right now. And he's like, oh, you are lucky. And then he, he runs off. And then the, the Saint Ronan, the priest guy, he's like, thanks God for, you know, causing that battle and sparing me. But he also curses the king. He's like, nah, I hope you're always naked. Okay, that's a weird thing to curse. You know, feels like there's like a homoerotic situation there. He's like, oh, I'll teach you. You hot ass guy. Now you're going to be always naked. So I, you know, that'll embarrass you. And I'll have to see you be naked all the time. And anyway, Ronan tries to make peace between the contending armies at Magrath, but he has no success. When he tries to bless the warriors, including Sweeney, the king throws his spear at the saint. Now a second spear, uh, then breaks against Ronan's bell, sends its shaft flying into the air. And in some versions, another spear he throws, kills one of Ronan's buddies. And he's like, oh, that makes me so mad. And he, and he curses him a second time, wishing to him that he may wander through the air now like the shaft of his spear and that he may die of a cast spear. So he throws a little double curse there. And then when Sweeney then tries to rejoin the battle, he seized with trembling, flees into a frenzy like a wild bird, flies up in the air, lands on top of a tree. And then uh, after he's not, he can't fight because he's stuck on a tree. And then the other team wins, the other army wins. And then when a kinsman after the losing the battle is unable to bring Sweeney back down from the tree to his own people. Now the mad king starts flying from treetop to treetop. He's like a weird monkey, just jumping from tree to tree. And he just does that all around Ireland. So he's really good at jumping. And, uh, and he goes fucking crazy. And he meets other weird people like the man of the wood. And his one faithful friend during, the, during this time is a dude named something fucking impossible to say in English. Unless you study Gaelic your whole life. And that person may have been born in the same uterus as him. Or is maybe a foster brother. It's not clear. Unpronounceable for me, maybe brother, to Sweeney. Rescues Sweeney three times. Keeps him informed about his family. His wife, Oren, remains faithful to Sweeney, even though he visits her and is like, get out of here. You're better off without me. And throughout this tale, haunted by things like headless cadavers and floating heads, on several occasions, uh, he regains his sanity for a moment, once asked to return to his own people, but Ronan prays that the king should not be allowed to come back, right? Because he's going to resume his persecution of the church. And then this narrative is interspersed with a number of poems, some of them about, you know, Sweeney, uh, you know, doing a variety of things, some of them in his voice. 
Two of the most memorable come late in the narrative uh, are in praise of nature and of trees. The story's big on trees. So what the fuck is this story about? It ends with Sweeney's conversion to Christianity. I kind of. His tale actually ends with him being stabbed by a spear after taking a drink of milk from a little cup made out of dry cow shit. It's not even kidding in the the main tale. The history of Scots Irish people being so fucking crazy in this country, many of them my ancestors, makes more and more sense uh, the longer we go into this. My ancestors told some crazy ass stories that often did not make much sense and I guess this apple didn't fall from the tree. Uh, Enough of these cycles. Let's meet some creatures. This is the part I'm waiting for. I'll start off with leprechauns, which very well might come from later folklore and not from earlier mythology, but... Some think oral tales about this creature do come from, you know, mythology. So let's include them because, you know, they're leprechauns. Uh, The leprechaun, one of the few names I did not have to look up a YouTube pronunciation guide for. One of the world's most recognized mythical creatures. In today's popular culture, I think we typically think of leprechauns as small, mischievous, elf-like creatures. Usually clad in all green. They hoard treasure at the, you know, ends of rainbows. We also might think of uh, cheesy horror films. You know, that that whole uh, franchise. In Irish folklore, leprechauns are, first off, shorter than I imagined. They're supposed to be about a foot to a foot and a half tall. They're real little. They're related to elves and gnomes, uh, live in the bushes like little creepers, or in burrows carved into tree trunks, uh, and they spend their days, always dudes, working on just one shoe. Just a little tiny dude with a little hat, working on one shoe at a time. And he makes these shoes for other similar magical creatures. He can only make one pair of shoes a year. And he also has gold for some reason. I think the other creatures give him gold for their shoes. And then he hides from humans because he's so tiny and he knows that we'll take a shit from him if we catch him. And in some stories, leprechauns are pranksters. They might grant you three wishes if you catch him. Uh, There's many kinds of leprechauns. One such type is a potential cousin species known as Farderic. Described as having long snouts and skinny tails, these small fairies, leprechauns said to be fairies in uh, most Irish Irish mythology text sources. Uh, These ones wear red coats and capes. I'm sorry, caps, not capes. Uh, and an Irish far derrick appropriately translates to red man. And they're thought to be associated with nightmares. They can get into your head, kind of like Freddy Krueger. And these little motherfuckers delight in gruesome practical jokes. Like they'll, they'll do uh, terrible things like steal your baby and replace your baby with a changeling. And what's a changeling? It's a physically deformed and or intellectually impaired offspring of a fairy uh, or an elf. And what do they do with the human babies that they take? Well, they give them to the devil. So Satan will help them and other little fairy people retain magical powers. <laughs> Why are fairies so evil? Well, uh, who knows? I mean, this is, uh, this is an origin obviously influenced by the Catholics. Many of these legends, right? Uh, demonized by early monks. Uh, another form of leprechaun is a spriggan. It supposedly contains the soul of a giant in their tiny little bodies. And they're fucking pissed about it. They remember being a giant and they don't like being small now. And some tellings are the ghosts of giants. Or uh, some tellings are little monsters with distorted, deformed bodies made out of wood and tree leaves uh, who used to be giants. And even when they have tiny bodies, they have giant-sized strength. And in some stories, when they're really pissed, they can hulk out and briefly return to giant size. And they are also walking curses. Bad luck on two legs, responsible for crumbling castles into ruins, collapsing buildings. So stay away from Spriggans. They are, in all the stories, they're assholes. The puka is one of several Irish mythological creatures. Doesn't get uh, as much attention as maybe it deserves. This mischievous little fella, said to bring either good or bad fortune, can appear in various forms and sizes, uh, uh, various animal forms. Puka has the power of human speech, loves to confuse and terrify people. A puka can take the shape of an old man if it believes that that appearance will benefit them. It could be the form of a dog, cat, whatever. Some stories, uh, you'll hear that this uh, creature takes the appearance of a black horse with a wild mane. With golden eyes shining brightly. Sounds like Nimrod's horse, maybe. Other stories, you'll hear uh, people that claim to have encountered a puka that had taken on the form of a human with jet black hair. And if they like you, they might help you. And again, if they don't, they might ruin your life. So random, they are commonly said to entice humans to take a ride on their back, right? Especially when they're like a horse, but not necessarily just a horse. And then they give the rider a wild and terrifying journey before dropping the unlucky person back off of the place they were taken from. So if a super creepy creature... Start speaking like a human. It's like, come on, hop on. Oh, come on, go for a ride. Like if a deer is like, get on, get on. It's going to be so fun. Don't do it unless you're a thrill seeker. Then maybe it's going to give you the adrenaline rush you want because that's not really a deer. That's a, that's a puka. If you're an island. Now for fairies. Fairies among the best known of the many Irish folklore creatures. Uh, their presence seen in everything from Disney movies to video games. And uh, the fairies are a huge part, you know, uh, again, of Irish folklore. And they're split into two categories. 
Unseelie fairies and seely fairies. Unseelie, bad. Naughty. Seely, useful. Good. Uh, the ruler of all the fairies, the fairy queen, an important Celtic creature, often named Titania. She's often described as being both seductive and beautiful. Lucifina. And there are tons of different fairy species. Some sexy, some terrifying, some uh, creatures I would have never thought of as fairies. Uh, for some, it's a very broad category. Uh, the label of fairy has at times, uh, you know, applied only to specific magical creatures with human appearance, magical powers, penchant for trickery, at other times been used to describe any magical creature, you know, goblins, gnomes, whatever, you know, puka, uh, the, the dullahan, sometimes classified as a fairy. And it takes the form of a headless rider on a black horse. And according to legend, the dullahan, uh, this Irish folklore fairy creature uses a human spine as a fucking whip, which is awesome imagery terrible to see you know in, in person but pretty cool for like a story the dual hand can also foreshadow death if it calls out your name you're going to immediately drop dead so hope that that doesn't happen uh, many people see this creature as the inspiration for the headless horseman myth of sleepy hollow that will come much later to america then there are banshees also sometimes called fairies sometimes called women of the fairies uh, banshee one of the better known scariest of the many irish mythological creatures slash irish monsters also a source of contentious disagreement, as you'll soon see in today's Idiot to the Internet. Banshee can appear in many forms. She can be an old woman with frightening eyes, pale lady in a white dress, a beautiful woman wearing a shroud. Regardless of how she looks, uh, it's her sound that sends shivers up the spines of many. Their, their mournful keening or wailing, screaming or lamentation at night believed to foretell the death of either the person who hears it or a close relative. In Ireland, Banshees were believed to warn families of uh, only warn families of pure Irish descent. Often described as being evil, demonic, uh, typically live in the darkest part of the forest, according to many tales, or in a graveyard where they wander amongst the dead. Uh, thought that this legend comes from an old Irish custom of hiring mourners for the funerals of important nobles. People, you know, Women would come, they would be paid to wail and grieve excessively for someone to uh, show how important that person was, how missed they are, You know, known as keening. I hope, I hope I can do that when I die. I hope when I die, my family hires so many keening wailers. Like, like uh, really over the top, like a hundred, so many of them, way more than the family members present. And maybe some break dancers in a mariachi band. Just make it a weird, confusing spectacle. Uh, possibly the scariest of uh, all the Irish monsters is the Abertach. According to the 1875 volume, The Origin and History of Irish Names and Places by historian Patrick Weston Joyce, the Abertach are solitary sorcerer dwarfs with the power to rise from the grave and wreak havoc as undead creatures. You heard me, they're fucking lone Dwarf sorcerers. And the only way to subdue their power is to kill them with a U wood sword and bury them upside down. That sucks. I hope I don't see one because I don't have a U wood sword or know what the fuck that is or where to get it. I highly doubt there are any around here. There cannot be a big U wood sword market in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, in some iterations of the Abertok uh, myth, this creature drinks the blood of its subjects. Some academics believe that this monster, others uh, like it, inspired, you know. Uh, Irish author Bram Stoker to create Dracula, which, uh, you know, in turn influenced the modern day concept of vampires. And there are so many of these Celtic creatures. The Irish have their own brand of popular demons called the Bananach, some kind of supernatural race who haunt battlefields. There's Kelpies, found mostly in Scott Gaelic folklore. They live in swamps, marshes, bogs mostly, uh, uh, but can appear in like any body of water. These things in early myths looked a lot like horses with dark fur. Uh, but they didn't eat apples and hay and grasses and stuff. They ate people. They would lure people to the edge of the water. And then maybe you think like, oh, look at look at that pretty swamp horse hanging out at the edge of that dirty ass pond staring at me. I bet it wants me to pet it. And then eat your fucking face off. You just got kelpied. Uh, over time, they became mixed up with Satan, took on demonic features. They became half human, half demon horses. Two more. Selkies might be my favorite type of mermaid. Selkie can look like a regular ass seal. But no, sir, sexy ass lady in a magic seal costume. Not kidding. It's just like, oh, that's a seal. And then the seal's like, whoop, it rips off seal skin. Fucking sexy ass lady. First seal skin, then titties. And when it comes to the shore, it can take off its seal skin, right? Uh, and try and entice you, try and seduce you. Uh, if you're really lucky, it'll fuck you. So many hot ladies in Celtic mythology. They're very attractive. Not all of them uh, ladies though. Some are handsome dudes. Handsome home record dudes. Male counterparts. To the, uh, you know, female shrub slut, water sluts, seal sluts. These guys specifically seek out ladies who are unhappy in their marriages and seduce them. Horny ass selkies. One more, the, the Lanan she, another fairy, a demon fairy. And guess what it looks like? 
yes, another hot ass lady, an exceptional, uh, exceptionally beautiful woman. And she hangs out at cemeteries trolling for Dick. Not kidding. She hangs out at tombs looking for male lovers. She especially tries to seduce widowers visiting the graves of their dead wives. That's fucked up, but also you can interpret it as being pretty nice. They're grieving. They're lonely. You know, and she fucks them. And, uh, and she, she appears uh, to be great in bed. She fills her lover with pleasure at the expense, though, of shortening his life. Uh, she can also literally fuck you silly. She can make you lose your mind through her seductive dark magic. Uh, these are just a few of the many, you know, I don't know, cryptid-ish creatures running, swimming, flying, crawling, digging, fucking around on Ireland. How many other Celtic creatures were lost to history, especially on mainland Europe? Uh, before moving on to the last little bit of the suck where we wrap things up, uh, let's return to a segment we have not done in a long, long time. I was watching so many YouTube videos <laughs> this week and the comments were killing me. Like with so much of Celtic mythology, the origins of the stories of these creatures, you know, it's unknown. Their descriptions shift a bit from telling to telling. So to think you know exactly what these things are is absurd. You do not. But that does not stop a lot of people from claiming to have all the answers. Let's meet some of these people in today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. 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 Uh, I took part of some of the descriptions of the creatures I just went over uh, from a YouTube video titled The Incredible Creatures of Celtic Mythology and Folklore. Uh, mythology bestiary see you in history posted last uh, april 21st by see you in history has almost 500,000 views over 600 comments and here are some of my favorite <laughs> the top rated comment from mythic doyen voted up 558 times is the modern depiction on banshees portray them as evil beings but in truth they aren't evil at all all they are are omens and reminders that death was coming and that one should be prepared for it they are not evil. They are just doing their jobs. And again, I mean, not that this description is wrong from a lot of like, you know, uh, sources, but I just, I just love it when people speak with this much certainty about things that literally no one should be certain about and doing their jobs. Like what? <laughs> That's a weird way to phrase it too. Like, you know, like you watch, like they just like, clocking in. Well, I'm going to go do my whaling. Uh, and also cocky YouTube handle, uh, Banshee, uh, mythic, or sorry, not Banshee, Mythic Doyen, Supreme Mystic, someone who has the most mythic answers. Uh, must be so fun to be an expert about things that no one can actually uh, prove you wrong in. But then weird to do that to other people, be like, you know, you're wrong about something that no one can prove. Anyway, Maya Kusakai, another Banshee expert, and she comments, uh, no, it depend. A Banshee that had a good relationship with her family is a Banshee that look after her family after death. But Dark Banshee, who in life hated their family, they become monstrous banshee and hunt their family cursing them after death it depend about how their relationship was with their family and life okay cool maybe you and mythic doyen uh can go interview some banshees for an upcoming book or something uh <laughs> this personality drives me crazy user apateth lord of light is taking this video way wait i gotta say his name right apateth i think it's i'm pretty sure it's made up i tried to find a real basis and it just kept coming uh, i kept finding more of his content uh apateth lord of light uh, very serious. They post, don't forget what is called evil to one or many could have been a victim to them or their allegiances. And they refuse to allow them to rest by sending their images as spirits to those they want to control. It could be to hide the disgusting things they had done to them and they need others to attack them or curse them or act like they're afraid of them. Go after the conscious energy of the individual sending the images and you will find who the real culprit is. How do you do this? Twitches and stabs through the spirit. Others will try to escape by any means. Fucking what are you talking about? You just go after the conscious energy of the individuals. <laughs> you just got to stab through their spirit. Uh, I feel like the FBI might need to monitor this motherfucker. I feel like there's a decent chance that there's uh, either a body in Afateth, Lord of Light's apartment, or they have you know written out plans to someday hopefully have a body in their apartment. And I feel like there's a good chance uh, they're an in incel. Uh, hey, do you know Ron? Speaking of incels, do you know Ron of Queens Grove? If you do, tell him to stop being such a smug, cocky weirdo. He posts, there is some truth here. I like that. Uh, we could work on our pronunciation, though. Not pronunciation. That's not a word that no one said it was in this comment thread. Uh, I.E. <laughs> Lennon-she. That's how my Irish friends say it. Make it so. He actually writes that as it says, make it so. Secondly, these artworks are beautiful and all, but way too much clothing on these fey folk. Remember, they do not conform to Christian convention. I can fix that too. 
What? That's what Photoshop is for. I don't like this is a weird like insult job offer. Uh, please let me help you make your content so much better. It's uh it's not where it needs to be. I just can't stand this personality be <laughs> just the attitude. Make it so. Cuz I checked out his channel. He has uh he's a content creator. Ron is and he has 59 subscribers. <laughs> One of his videos has a thumbnail that says best friend that you never had. And it's a, it's a picture of him. And then it says, that is me. Another says, is this the sexiest man alive? And it's just a different, you know, picture of Ron. I don't think anybody needs Ron's help. I think, I think Ron needs a lot of other people's help. Broderick Elliott also is a dick writing sloppy research. If you're calling the Banshee evil at worst, they're neutral. And are corny pop art images really the best you can do? The images are awesome. He's the only person in the thread who complained. Uh, and I actually did look through every single comment. Really cool creature illustrations. Broderick also makes uh, quite a few videos and he has eight subscribers and no images to go along with any of them. Broderick, take it down a notch. Focus more on your content, not on other people's content. Uh, and again, no one knows everything for sure about the legend of the Banshee. Uh, user Central Point cracks me up in this comment thread posting, you forgot the internet troll who lives in his mother's dark basement, leaving nasty online comments and forever be rejected and will be forever rejected by women. I know it's not like a new joke, but in the in the thread, in the context of thread, I liked it. Uh, and then one more, just because it's so insane, has nothing to do with Celtic mythology. User out of service writes, can you do a video on the Antichrist and the mark of the beast economic collapse as foretold? This is not a time to turn to fables. Okay. Weird to feel the need to write that. <laughs> I mean, I guess there should be no videos. On anything on YouTube other than videos about the, uh, you know, Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast uh, economic collapse. Okay. Uh, user uh, out of service, uh, please get help. Go to the closest hospital and just keep repeating what you just wrote and repeat it to everyone you see, getting louder and louder until someone restrains you and gives you the meds that I feel you clearly need to get your life uh, hopefully back on track. Let's get out of here. Idiots of the internet. Okay, wrapping things up here. Uh, Celtic mythology is fucking confusing. Also fascinating. Uh, and its popularity is making a comeback. After facing near extinction at the hands of the British on account of uh, 17th and 18th century laws that saw many of the myth-preserving manuscripts and books scribed by medieval Irish monks destroyed, adding even more confusion to all this. I didn't even mention that before. The monks write all this stuff down and then <laughs> centuries later, the British are like, nah, we gotta burn these books. Uh, Celtic mythology has recently re rebounded in a big way. Indeed, in recent years, Irish mythology, the most well-preserved form of Celtic mythology, has been experiencing something of a renaissance. Irish mythology has been undergoing a new wave of popularity in modern fantasy writing, uh, with numerous retellings and fantasy novels based loosely on Irish sagas. Uh, because the Celtic mythological records are incomplete and likely lost forever, there's so much room for fiction writers to use their creativity to fill in the gaps of the myths and make their own fantasy tales. So just uh, like an imagination springboard. Uh, and speaking of imagination and writers, the Irish have been pretty fucking good at writing for a long time. They produce some big names in the literary world, world especially for a small nation. Uh, the imagination strong in the Celtic DNA. Let's meet a few of these. James Joyce, usually the first name that pops into people's heads when they think of Irish writing. One of the most significant writers in the English-speaking world thanks to his unique modernist style that revolutionized fiction in the early 20th century. He was interested in all sorts of mythology. Excuse me. His best-known work was Ulysses. An enormous tome that parallels the episodes of Homer's Odyssey uh, based on Greek mythology in various different literary styles, including the stream of consciousness technique he became famous for. First published in book form in 1922, it's been called stylistically dense and exhilarating, generally regarded as a masterpiece, been the subject of numerous volumes of uh, commentary and analysis. Joyce, born in Dublin in 1882, spent his youth there, spent his later years uh, largely in Italy, Switzerland, and France, dying in Zurich after complications from a perforated ulcer at the age of 58. And for many years, now uh, on June 16th each year, the author, his famous work commemorated, most famous work commemorated all around the world with a series of literary events known as Bloomsday, chosen because of the date of the events of Ulysses, which also happened to be the day Joyce and his wife, Nora, went on their first date. Uh, while Ulysses, hands down, Joyce's most well-known talked about book, uh, notoriously difficult to make sense of, even for those already familiar with his style and way of writing, even for literary scholars. Uh, another, another of his books, Dubliners, however, much less complex. It's a book of short stories about all sorts of Dublin characters from the early 20th century. Perfect view of what life was like in the city at that time from various perspectives, from the aristocracy all the way down to the poorer classes, everything in between. Uh, another of the major Irish names in the annals of the English-speaking literary world, Oscar Wilde. 
born in Dublin, 1854. Uh, during his time, Oscar, uh, one of the most recognizable personalities in the British Isles, thanks to his charisma, unrivaled wit, fancy dress style, but his life would end tragically. Uh, his life also probably worth sucking in the future. He was uh, very well read, coming from an aristocratic family. They gave him an excellent education. So writing and journalism, natural career pa- path for him. Uh, he enjoyed immediate and wide success during his 20s and 30s with his plays, which at the time provided biting satirical social commentary. Unfortunately, it all went wrong for Oscar when evidence emerged of homosexual activities, which uh, was then a criminal offense. He was in prison for two years, then fled to France immediately after his release, where he would die penniless and unknown at the age of 46. What a shame. Wilde's plays and novels, much more accessible to normal humans uh, like me than Joyce's. The Importance of Being Earnest, one of his best loved plays, still gets lots of laughs by contemporary or modern, excuse me, audiences. Uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, another excellent story that also still has relevance even though it was first published in 1890. I've been adapted into two films. I've seen one of them. It was uh, excellent. Uh, Explores the perils of vanity and selfishness with a dark and supernatural twist that I won't spoil for you. Uh, Wilde used the picture of Dorian Gray as his autobiography, claiming Basil Hallward is is what I think I am, Lord Henry what the world thinks me, Dorian what I would like to be in other ages, perhaps. And that book would be banned for its sexual homosexual undertones and would help send Wilde to prison. Wilde also wrote a book of children's stories uh, like The Happy Prince and other tales in 1888. And there are so many other, you know, great Irish writers. There's Bram Stoker, famous author of Dracula, W.B. Yeats, talented poets, one of the most prominent figures that spearheaded the Irish literary revival in the uh, late 1800s. C.S. Lewis, author of the seven book series. uh, And I'm second guessing myself on Yeats. I want to say maybe Yeats, if I I said that wrong. C.S. Lewis, the author of the seven book series, The Chronicles of Narnia. Started with the uh, highly successful Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Often thought of a, as a British author and Christian apologist, but uh, was born and spent his early life in Belfast, Northern Ireland, before moving to England to attend boarding school at the age of 10. So not from the Republic of Ireland, but from the island itself, you know, drank some of the water there. Uh, also the famous potato eater, Jonathan Swift from Dublin. Prolific writer. Brought the world's most famous work, Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels, way back in 1726. Uh, and then there is perhaps the most influential uh, Irish writer, Dublin's Samuel Beckett, playwright, poet, novelist. His work fits into the modernist genre, usually based on various elements of human nature, often with dark black comedy undertones. Waiting for Godot, considered to be Beckett's masterpiece. Two-act play in which two characters wait for the arrival of a figure known as Godot, who never shows up, so naturally not much happens, but I've seen it, and the lack of action, not missed because the dialogue's so fucking good. Uh, the play opened up to much debate in 1953, still regularly performed today. Various interpretations on what the play actually means have been put forward. No general consensus. An Irish story that is both captivating and confusing. That is on brand. Uh, 1969, Beckett awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, and let's truly wrap up now. Is your brain tired? My brain is. My brain has been stretched. Uh, the Celtic people have a long and mysterious history. It spans much further into the world than just Ireland or even the British Isles. United by language, stories, and their Druid-led religion, the Celts survived countless wars and attempts to squash their culture. In the end, Ireland, parts of Scotland and Wales, you know, uh, little little pockets of England, really the last place the Celts uh, would be safe from the ever-expanding reach of the Romans, and that is where their rich tradition of sci-fi fantasy storytelling revolves around. But the Catholic Church made it where uh, Rome could not, and, uh, you know, made it where the Romans' uh, soldiers could not. And while they didn't stamp the Celts out, they did stamp out a lot of their history. All of the old written sources we have on Irish mythology come from Christian writers and they, you know, change the original stories. And now the Celts have heroes that were probably really gods and gods and creatures that probably weren't as evil as they've been made out to be by Satan obsessed authors, you know, twisting their stories. So pretty sad how much of their history has been whitewashed, but in a way makes it all a bit more magical. We can put our own interpretation on it. since we don't know for sure what the stories really were. We can play the, I don't know, maybe, or, oh, I wonder if, you know, games. Uh, it reminds me randomly of songs, or this all reminds me randomly of songs I wrote and played in a band uh, when I was in college. We were supposed to record all of our stuff when we graduated, but we never did. And I'm so glad. I was sad about it then, but so glad now. Now all I have, you know, of these songs uh, are memories, you know, uh, and I remember them being so good. I remember playing at a party, people dancing, you know, my memory is, uh, you know, filtered through some alcohol, people smiling, singing along with a few of our originals. It was such a fun time. I remember the emotions. If I actually heard those songs today, I have a feeling I would be massively disappointed that they would not live up to my memory. 
In my mind, they're wrapped up in so many good times, right? We're all so young, no responsibilities, lots of alcohol, lots of sexual energy, frivolous fun. I don't want to shine the harsh light of reality onto any of that, you know? And there is that chance that the original Celtic origin stories might not be as great as we can just kind of think they might be, right? The adaptations might be better. We don't know. And now since we don't have them, you know, we can just tell ourselves that the original stories were so much better and we never get to be proven wrong. You know, we can tell ourselves that the gods were so much more powerful and magical and amazing. And that's, uh, it's fun to do. Uh, I hope you learned a lot about the Celts. I hope you didn't get too hung up on me not being great at Gaelic. Uh, and you, and you had a good time with all this today. I did have a good time as, as hard as it was, man. Th- it was a motherfucker to research, but I did learn a lot. And for that, I'm glad. So thank you, Nimrod. Thank you, Space Lizards, for the challenge. Time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Celtic mythology is both a huge subject and a huge subject with huge gaps in understanding about it. All of it comes from an oral tradition that was written down, you know, uh, secondhand by Christian priests after Ireland was converted to Christianity's hundreds and uh, perhaps thousands of years after the myths began. Number two, the Celtic people, not just Irish folk. They come from all over Europe and as far east as modern day Turkey. In ancient times, they were bonded by a similar language system rooted in Gaelic, shared similar spiritual beliefs and cultural ideas. There are six areas now recognized as modern Celtic nations that include Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Brittany, the Isle of Man, and Cornwall. Number three, the Druids. While there is not a ton of knowledge about the Druids, they were Celt experts in all sorts of fields from healing to preaching the faith to political planning to philosophy. Uh, You know, uh, maybe they did some shit with lightsabers. Who knows? The Druids, along with the Bards, also able to unite the distant Celtic tribes together, make them a more formidable enemy to the Romans and Greeks and other foes, the Huns, etc., the Slavs, by circulating news amongst the regions and keeping the language uniform. Number four, Finn McCool and the Salmon of Knowledge. Whoever came up with that story had to have been on drugs. Uh, It is not the only salmon-based myth in the Celtic canon either. Number five, new info identifying as Celtic in modern times, pretty new, uh, has its origins in opposition to British rule. The 19th and 20th centuries witnessed a full-blown Celtic revival in the British Isles, where Celtic culture had largely been dead for a long time, uh, driven by political anger over British rule in places like Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Musicians, artists, authors proudly began to openly embrace a pre-Christian Celtic identity. Prior to this, uh, all the Celtic jewelry and Celtic talk and music and its association with Ireland and more that we use today just really didn't happen for centuries. The church and British rule just did not allow it. Time suck. Top five takeaways. All right. Celtic mythology has been sucked. Let's celebrate with some music. Ha <laughs> ha Yay. All right. Ah, hit it. Is that the best guy or is that the worst guy? That was the best guy. Uh, thanks to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making Time Suck every week. Thanks to Zach Flannery for pointing me in some good directions this week and for his two plus years of service here at Bad Magic. We're going to miss you, Script Keeper. Uh, now go be the bard uh, you're supposed to be. And actually, he has a lot of Celtic heritage, I believe. Thanks to uh, Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, again, for having uh, for giving me the time to do this, uh, especially this week. A lot of, lot of late nights. Uh, thanks to Joe Paisy for production, the Reverend Doctor, making it sound so good. Uh, thanks to Bit Elixir for keeping the Time Suck app running smooth. Logan the Art Warlock Keith, creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com. Running socials with Liz the Enchantress Hernandez, uh, who also runs our Cult of Curious Facebook 2 private Facebook page. There's so many Time Suck related private Facebook pages out there now. Uh, and she does that one with her wonderful All Seen Eyes moderators. Uh, thanks to Beefsteak and his Mod Squad, keeping all the meat, steaks, ma- meat sacks happy over on Discord. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we dive back into the world of true crime with one of the most controversial cases in true crime history, the disappearance of Lacey Peterson and the subsequent trial and conviction of her husband, Scott Peterson. Uh, Scott's recent uh, appeal trial reminded uh, me and us of this crazy crime and trial. Sometime original trial, sometime between the evening of December 23rd and the morning of December 24th, 2002, 27-year-old Lacey Peterson, seven months pregnant, disappears from the home she shares with her husband, Scott, in Modesto, California. Scott and Lacey seem to have the classic American dream life. They met as undergrads, got married, briefly owned a business, uh, were ready to set themselves up in a house that they could fill with children. And then after a, a little trouble with getting pregnant, Lacey is excited to be carrying her firstborn, a boy. They decided to name Connor. 
But, uh, you know, this idealized image comes crashing down in the weeks after her disappearance when news outlets discovered that Scott was having an ongoing affair with a massage therapist named Amber Frey, who believed that Scott was unmarried and that he didn't want children. That couple with Scott's so-called weird behavior in the course of the investigation and his lack of an alibi for the time when Lacey went missing led to him becoming the primary suspect in Lacey's disappearance. Later, when her body is discovered, um, months later, on a marshy shore, becomes the number one suspect for her murder. In the ensuing trial, Scott will be sentenced to death as news outlets run coverage of his trial. People like Nancy Grace seek to make him public enemy number one. But did Scott deserve it? Did uh, Does being an asshole or not behaving how people expect you uh, to behave mean that you're guilty of murder? How did the media make this tragic story into a marketable spectacle? So all of this and more in next week's Time Suck. It'll you know be a suck akin to uh, Jody Arias and the Menendez brothers. And now let's head on, on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Uh, starting off this week's updates with something light and funny. Uh, scared sucker Austin Kurtz uh, fell for one of my tricks last week. My uh, trichomoniasis, fake symptom bullshit. <laughs> Let's hear his fear as he writes, fuck you and your tricks. And he spells it T-R-I-C-H-S. Uh, I've been with the same woman for six years. I love you, Melissa. And you still have me believing I may one day lose my dick. I've had my share of close calls. As you read the symptoms, I was in the bathroom naked, just building myself up until you got to the rotting balls. And I was like, no, do I have it? I can't tell. Then you said you were joking and my common sense came back. Thanks for the hard laugh, man. Hail Nimrod. Well, I'm glad that your brief terror ended in relief and laughter, Austin. Uh, Hail Nimrod, thanks for sharing that to make us laugh. And, you know, keep your wing clean so you don't, you know, have your dick rot off. Spooning sucker Katie fell for a lie that was Lindsay's last week uh, and then felt better about herself. And now she's going to feel worse. She writes, uh, I wanted Lindsay to know that I totally fell for the spooning story. I actually thought, huh, who to thunk? I almost felt dumb until you said Lindsay also fell for it. No, Katie, Lindsay did not fall for it. She made it up. She's a liar. She tricked you. It was her lie. She's not to be trusted either. Right? This narrative of like, I'm the naughty one. She's a good one. Well, it's time to second guess it. Right? And she's Polish. How could she be trusted? Uh, you were not alone though. On the secret suck this week, we had several messages sent in uh, for people falling for that lie and it, and it makes Lindsay very happy. She's very proud of herself. So maybe she'll share more lies in the future. Uh, now for a correction from last week. I fucked up on some philosophy. Uh, Christine, one of several suckers who called me out on it and I'm glad. She writes, Dan, I love your podcast and listen to it often, but I have one small beef that I'm gonna lay out what I think is a concise, but it's probably not concise as you might guess from the first sentence of this email, which is an atrocious and unforgivable run on. I like, I like your writing style. Uh, truly. Uh, sometimes when you get fired up about stuff, which is great and fun to listen to, you can occasionally take things out of context and don't really give them a fair shake. Agreed. No disagreement here, Christine. Uh, in your most recent episode on Oneida, you briefly mentioned Sir Thomas More. You took one sentence out of one passage from a man who wrote literally dozens of works, treatises during his lifetime, acted as if you had dismantled this man's entire philosophy by reading one sentence and giving counterexamples to a straw man argument that you had built up in front of you. <laughs> Uh, let me play some bagpipe to distract from being guilty as charged. Uh, I would like to offer just one possible alternative interpretation, citing just a few more moments from the same work, Utopia, for you to consider. When Moore states every man has a right to everything, he is not remarking that everybody in Utopia can take whatever they like from whatever they like. He is not saying every man has a right to every house or piece of food or person in proper context. He is instead referring to necessities. In fact, he follows immediately with, they all know that if they can... That if care is taken to keep the public stores full, no private man can want anything. For among them, there is no unequal distribution so that no man is poor, none in necessity, and though no man has anything, yet they are all rich. Essentially, every man has a right to every essential thing. Food, shelter, community, justice. Yeah, I, I'm seeing this now. Uh, every man has a right to not starve to death, to not be homeless, to not be so on the margins that he's poor while another man is inconceivably rich. Every man also has a responsibility to contribute to the community's public stores of uh, these essentials as they're able. Moore's description of utopia also includes that men in power should not be as idle as drones that subsist on other men's labor and where instead a man in power has more regard to the riches of his country than to his wealth i.e. men have a right to not be exploited and an obligation to not exploit others. Success for one man should also translate to proportionate success for those whose labor provided that man his success. I personally do not find these ideas to be radical or at all dissimilar to ideas you have expressed in previous episodes where you've mentioned labor, wealth disparities, etc. I would love to hear your thoughts with this interpretation in mind 
Uh, regardless of what you ultimately come to believe about Moore's writings, they should at least be approached with an appreciation for their nuance. And aside, if you've ever heard The Tragedy of the Commons, an essay from the 1800s, Utopia is essentially an opposing take on the same ethical quandary. Centuries apart, these men separately approach the same question, come to very different conclusions. Lloyd argues that open access resource systems will eventually collapse. Moore argues that communities can cooperate to contribute and distribute resources prudently and fairly. Suffice to say, these are questions which humans have wrestled with for ages and will continue to wrestle with. Thanks for taking the time to read this email. Hope it wasn't too harsh or long-winded. Again, love the podcast. Look forward to hopefully seeing your stand-up again soon in Chicago. Best, Christine. Well, Christine, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, yes, you clearly know a lot more about more than I do. Yeah, I no, I swung and missed on that one. Uh, I'm not going to fight back with anything you said. I, I, I will only say this podcast is a challenge due to time constraints every week. You know, there's limited time to interpret a huge amount of data, make it entertaining, add my mythology, keep it accurate, distill it into an understandable narrative, et cetera. Some topics I've been finding out the last couple of years, way easier to do that with than others. And I have the same amount of time each week. This wasn't something I guess I really truly anticipated. Uh, and I and I just won't have the time to properly research certain things I like. So I'm trying to pare things down, not broaden my scope too big. And I, and I try to avoid mistakes like this by just not diving into too many tangents that I don't understand. No excuse uh, for my misinterpretation of more, just an explanation. Uh, I did not research that quote further because I did think at the time I understood it, but I was wrong. I was so focused on John Humphrey Noyes, I rushed through some of the philosophy he built his community on, and, and I should have not done that. So I thank you for the reminder. Good to be humbled from time to time. Uh, thanks for clearing up my mistake. Uh, no, not just for me, but for the audience. Uh, noise though, can we all agree? He was a fucking maniac. Uh, see you in Chicago and hail Nimrod. And, uh, now I'll end on, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of anger from a fan, but also some love, uh, and some righteous anger. Uh, polyamorous sack Sam did not care for some of my comments last week and his anger is fair. And I'm glad he wrote in as well. And here's what he said. Uh, time suck. Never thought I would have to write into this podcast. My name is Sam. And I say all of this with love. I love all the Bad Magic podcasts and of course we'll continue to listen. But Dan, sincerely fuck you for bagging on polyamorous relationships. You sound like every homophobe out there when you said, I can't imagine being raised by multiple parents. I would take my parents' divorce and all over that. It sounds so familiar to all the people who say, I would take my parents' divorce over having two moms or two dads. I am myself in a very happy, very healthy polyamorous relationship. I live with both my boyfriends in a house I bought for us. We may not have children or ourselves yet, but I have seen people in long-term polyamorous relationships raise wonderful children, my best friend being one of them. Her stepfather, her mom, and her mom's boyfriend have been together for over 20 years and raised three amazing children. Just because some polyamorous relationships are toxic and seem outside the box doesn't mean they all are. There are many happy polyamorous people around the world. Don't judge us because a cult gave us a bad name. I would say the same thing for straight people myself. If I looked at every straight relationship and assumed they were the exact same way my parents were, I would avoid straight people entirely. Please fix any typos. As I had said before, I am literally dumb. I uh, still love the podcast, but I'm a little mad at you right now. Your fellow dummy, creeper in space is Sam. Well, Sam, first of all, uh, first off, you're not dumb. Uh, there was literally no typos to fix. Also, yeah, maybe not the best context last week for me to bring up that argument uh, and make those you know comments. In my mind, I was not comparing monogamy to the, uh, you know, kind of polyamory you're engaged in. I was comparing it to the kind of polyamory noise was engaged in. And I do wonder what you would think or what you do think of that. You know, like what if you were not in a relationship with two other people, but with literally 300? Uh, would that be better or worse for kids to grow up in than monogamy? I honestly have no idea, really at the end of the day, because we don't have the data to compare the two. My concern was and still is with polyamory in general, uh, emotional fulfillment of each person involved, right? Can you be as close to several people as you can be to one? Can you keep things equal? Can everyone love each other equally so that no one feels left out? For me, personal relationships are more of a struggle and require more work where I have a hell of a time trying to figure out one person and I work at it. And if I had two people with different emotional needs, for me, it would be overwhelming. So I definitely could be doing some projecting there. You apparently handle it just fine. Uh, I would just always be worried uh, or jealous or insecure. Is the other person being left out? Am I being left out? Uh, this person happier with me? Am I happier with this person than that person? Um, so what I can handle though, yeah, not necessarily what you can handle. Uh, and, and for the record, I, I hope you did hear how I phrased that entirely, where I said, personally, I'm glad I was raised in a monogamous household, divorce and all, as opposed to the polyamorous shit show that was the Oneida community. 
So I, I, I think some of what you felt was pulled a little out of context. And that's, that's according to my notes. I thought I stayed on script there. Maybe when I was uh, recording it, I didn't phrase it how I had it written. So yeah, so I was not trying to compare monogamy to all forms of polyamory. Sorry, I did not make that more clear. Uh, I, I will have Lucifina spank me for later. Uh, love you, Sam. And let's get out of here. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Uh, keep an eye out for fairies this week. Uh, not all of them seem friendly. Uh, but if you do see one in the cemetery, well, you should probably try and fuck it. it. Sounds like it might be worth the risk of insanity and death. And also, keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Hey, Joe, you should come in. I want to play a game with you. Okay. Let's play Let's play a game. Uh, it's called Best or Worst Bagpipe. Okay. So don't look. Okay. I'm don't gonna, look. I'm going to get my ears out from my beanie. Okay. Don't, don't look. Don't oh, peek. Don't look. Don't Jesus. peek. Okay. Okay. Uh, best or worst. Best. That was worst. God damn it. Okay. Again, best or worst. It's the worst. That's the best. God damn it. I, it's so hard. Why? It's, Why? Who invented these? Uh, the devil. <laughs>